U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in the Region 10 Seattle office. Hi, I'm Tony Barber. I'm the director of EPA's Oregon Operations Office out of Portland. Ted Bunch, I'm the coordinator of the PARC. PARC is the Pesticide Analytical and Response Center. You see it up there. Mike Odenthal, I'm with the Oregon Department of Agriculture Pesticide Division out of Salem. I'm Alan Henning with the Environmental Protection Agency out of Eugene. And where is Greg? He's out here. There's two folks out in the uh, entryway that uh, maybe they could just step over for a second so you can get a gander around. Hi, I'm Greg Pettit. I work for the EQ. And? <laughs> uh, Richard Kaufman, C for Foxy Substances in the Z Registry. I'm so much for the Z Control Branch. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'm Karen Bishop, Community Involvement Coordinator for the Disclosure Investigation. Okay. So, um, folks who are out the back, if you want to, there are still some seats here. Uh, get going here in earnest. So, some of you I recognize from um, other meetings that we've had. Uh, I don't know how many of you have never been here before, so. For the sake of folks who haven't been here before, I'm going to I'm going to uh, do a little introduction and, and uh, try to provide some context for the work that's happening here. So if, if you've never heard this before, um, you'll have you'll be able to kind of catch up to where we are. Um, <clears throat> this is an exposure investigation. The focus of it is the Highway 36 area, uh, the Eight Township area, and the in the Triangle Lake. Um, the the organizing body for state agencies in this investigation is PARC, uh, as Ted described. It's the Pesticide Analytical and Response Center. It's a, um, it's a statutorily defined group um, of several state agencies, and you're going to get a list of them, those um, in just a minute, that come together to address pesticide exposure issues around the state. The Oregon Department of Agriculture is the administrative body, body for PARC. Um, they co-chair PARC and uh, along with the Oregon Health Authority. So the Oregon Health Authority and um, ODA co-chair PARC and then the other state agencies are involved in it. There are some other folks who are involved um, in this investigation. Uh, as you heard, the Department of Environmental Quality, Department of Forestry, and, and the um, Oregon Department of Agriculture, uh, in addition to the Oregon Health Authority, there are other state agencies in PARC. Um, those are in the red. 
who are not actively involved in this investigation. But we also have some company from uh, two federal partners, the US EPA and the CDC, do uh, Dr. Captain Kaufman, who just came to the back. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry is a, it's a subgroup um, within the CDC. It's a public health entity that's specifically um, uh, in place to look at and identify when people might be exposed to contaminants in their environment and to do assessment work to see if there are risks from those environmental exposures. So ATSDR has had an active role in this investigation as well. So before we get into the heart of this, I want to talk a little bit about um, this type of work and kind of what it is and what it's not. Um, because it is, it is scientific study, it is scientific inquiry, but it's not a research study per se. Um, and the big difference between a research study and what we're doing has to do with the, the testing of a prediction or a hypothesis for the relationship between the two things. Um, and the degree to which what you learn about the relationship between those two things, how broadly you can apply that knowledge to other, um, other areas, other life areas. Um, while there are folks here who um, hypothesize that there is a relationship between the pesticides that are applied in this area and whether or not people are being exposed, that's not what this is. This is an exposure investigation, and in an exposure investigation, what we're trying to do is determine if exposures are happening and to characterize those exposures in the past and in the present and potentially in the future and to identify if there are gaps in information that we need to, to do that work to go and collect that information. So that's, that is what we're doing here. We're trying to identify and try to answer some questions about what might be happening in this community. Those questions which you'll see in just a second, and you're going to be sick to death of them by the end of tonight because we're going to go over them and over them, is what it is that this exposure investigation is built around. It's a set of questions about this place. That slide is not actually very helpful, but if you squint at it, you can see, um, probably if those of you who live in this area will, will maybe recognize that, that is, that's the area that we're talking about. Those uh, those yellow squares are eight townships in and around Highway 36, that's the red line, where the, that's the exposure investigation area, that's where we've been looking. And this is what we've been doing. Most of the action for the exposure investigation has been happening in the last couple of years. Hence, we've had several meetings, we've been involved in a number of activities, but it didn't start a couple of years ago. It started. Um, for the agencies, specifically the park agencies, um, EPA and ATSDR, it started um, back in time. We began to hear from some local residents about concerns uh, about the ways that pesticides are applied in this area and whether or not those application practices could be causing uh, could be cause for concern. Um, <clears throat> in 2010, a group of folks uh, approached the EPA and asked for their for EPA's help uh, to, to answer that question. EPA, because it's a federal agency, turned to its sister agency, which is ATSDR, and um, asked for help from ATSDR. So EPA and ATSDR became involved in 2010. Now, <clears throat> the Oregon Health Authority, state agencies have relationships with federal agencies. Um, because federal agencies can't be everywhere. Um, and state agencies, uh, we have um, uh, primacy in the states where we function. So for, on the health side, the Oregon Health Authority had a pre-existing relationship with ATSTR to do the work that ATSTR is charged with by Congress to look at whether or not people are exposed to environmental conditions that could cause harm. The Oregon Department of Agriculture has a relationship with the EPA to administer the, the federal um, law governing pesticide use. It's called FIFRA. So those communications began between the federal agencies and the state agencies um, because of the petition that was, um, uh, was sent to EPA in 2010. While that, was, that, while that petition was circulating, a group of residents here um, sought the help of a very well-known, very well-respected researcher who used to be at the CDC at the National Environmental Health Lab, um, and they asked for this researcher's help to analyze some, some of their urine. 
Um, they were very concerned that during the season, the, there's two uh, application seasons, there's the summer, fall, and then there's the winter, spring, that during that application season there might be exposures occurring. And so they asked for her help to um, get their urine analyzed. Um, in the spring of 2011, the results of those urine tests were um, communicated to the uh, Department of Forestry's board um, at a meeting. Uh, and that those results indicated that people may very well be getting exposed to, to pesticides in this area. The Department of Agriculture, I mean, excuse me, the Department of Forestry turned to its sister agencies in the park, remember all those agencies, and asked for assistance to, to do this investigation. So that was how the whole thing kind of got, got going. That summer was the first time we had a public meeting here. I believe it was two years ago, but it was. Um, and we, at that time, we had an idea for how we were going to carry out this investigation, and um, we set about doing that. That summer, we began some testing. We, um, we recruited folks around an area where we thought uh, uh, we would be able to go back to them again and again and collect their urine over repeated seasons. Um, and that was before we learned some things that we really needed to understand about how pesticides were applied and where we could go back to. But we, we, we recruited a group of 60 people, 66 people, and, um, and collected their urine. We also collected environmental samples from around the homes in which they live. We collected their drinking water, um, food sources from their property, so um, vegetation, honey, um, eggs, milk, things that they would be ingesting. And we collected their soil samples as well. Um, and that was, a, that was the very first uh, amount of data that we were able to communicate. We communicated that, we, said we um, uh, had a meeting, um, told you about the results of the urine samples and the, um, the environmental samples. In the spring, that following spring, we had intended to do another round of testing. Um, we were not able to do that because of, of what we didn't understand about the ways that um, harvests occur and the ways that pesticides are applied to those harvests. What we thought was, was that if those original 66 people, we would, again, we would be able to go back to them again and again. But those, of course, were not where uh, pesticides were going to be applied that following spring. And application records, pesticide application records over a period of time so that we could take the biologic and the environmental samples that we collected and we could compare them to the, um, to the application records and see if there's any relationship between those application records, the pesticides that we know were applied, and uh, what we're able to detect or not detect in those samples that we collected, the urine samples, the environmental samples. So this last year, all this last year, what we've been doing is analyzing the data that we had gotten. Um, we also, at, during that time, um, we were in communication with the community who had collected those original urine samples back in 2010. And we began to look at those data to see if and how we would be able to use those data as, in, in this investigation. And we did a tremendous amount of work to test the quality of the data, the chain of custody of the data, um, so that we could make sure that the data had been handled appropriately in the collection, had been handled correctly in the, in the uh, shipping, and in the uh, receipt at the other end, and in the, and in the analysis. So over this last year, we've been working with uh, those additional data, those additional urine data, the pesticide application record data, some additional data that we also got from community members here, uh, their uh, water samples that they had collected and um, some air samples that they had collected. And the report that is out now is a compilation of the, those data that we have collected and have done some analysis on and, uh, and we're by no means done um, because there, there are actually not a lot of data to work with. Um, but we felt that it was important to come back to you at this point because we've reached an important milestone in the investigation. So <clears throat> I'm just going to pause for a second. I'm terribly sorry, you're going to have to listen to me all night. I have a cold, and so I'm, I'm a little froggy. And if I, if I dab my eye, it's not because I'm emotional, it's because I have a cold in my eye. So, um, anyway, so here we are. Uh, we completed the report in December. Um, the report itself is quite long. Anybody that's seen it can tell you that it's quite long. Um, it went through extensive review uh, within the agencies that participated in the development of it. Um, it is an OHA report. I just, I just want to make that point. 
it's an OHA report, but it was very collaboratively, collaboratively reviewed by all the state agencies and the federal agencies involved in this. Um, and that review uh, went through uh, basically the end of March. At that point, we were ready to release it. So um, the report is now out for public consumption. Um, this meeting tonight is one of kind of the first uh, opportunities that we're going to have to speak to you about what's in the report. You're going to have a lot of opportunities to speak back to us about what you think about the report, um, uh, any, any um, constructive comments that you'd like to provide to us about how the report might be modified. This is a, it's, it's called a public comment version. It's a draft version of the report. We'll be taking public comments for 60 days. Um, so you will have until July 9th to provide us written comments. The comments that you make tonight, the, well, we're going to have a speaking session a little bit later, those are not, um, they're not going to work for our process in terms of public comments for the uh, revised report. So if you, if you want to make specific comments on the report itself and how it might be revised, you're going to need to do that in writing, and you'll have an opportunity in the report itself to tell you how to, how to supply those, report, those, uh, those comments. So um, we have not actually analyzed all the data that we have. One area of data that we haven't uh, completely analyzed yet are the application records that we got. We analyzed one year of the application records. We received two more years um, of those records, and um, those still need to be reported out on. And you're going to hear tonight about um, what's left to do in this investigation. So, all right. So. Way back when in the initial meeting, I took you through this, what do we, what do we know, what don't we know, what's knowable and what's not knowable. Um, and not in the grand scheme of you know, existential life or anything like that, but in terms of the exposure investigation, what do we know, what don't we know, what's knowable and what's not knowable related to these six questions. So these are the questions. First and foremost, are folks in this area being exposed to pesticides from local application practices? That's the heart of the question. Um, if we determine that people are being exposed, the question then becomes what pesticides are being exposed to? What levels are they being exposed to? What are the sources of those pesticides? What are the pathways? What are the ways that those pesticides might be getting into their bodies? And can we determine any potential health risks from those exposures? So that's the frame for this, and that's, that's the direction that we're going. Okay. Big question. So from here on, the, the report contains a lot of text, lots of information, lots of supporting information, but we're going to go right through the conclusions. If you haven't read the report, I um, encourage you to do that. There are a lot of conclusions. The conclusions are, they're, they're incremental conclusions. And what, I say incremental because they might seem like small bits of, of progress, toward answering these questions, but they're important because they, they, we get into a period, we get into a process of we know this, okay, we know this much, we don't know this much, we know this much about this, we don't know this much about that. And that tells us where we still need to look. So, from the standpoint of that first question, um, what we found is that folks are being exposed to pesticides in this area. Um, we know that because we tested folks, we were able to use urine sampling from tests that were taken in the fall, in the, excuse me, in the spring of 2011, and then later in the fall of 2011. It's not possible to know at this point exactly whether those exposures are the result of local application practices. And we're going to get into a longer discussion through the conclusions about what we, what we can say about um, those observed exposures. Okay, so this is why I say folks are being, uh, we know that folks are being exposed in this area. Um, in the spring of 2011, we had confirmed exposures of both 2,4-D and atrazine um, in 39 samples. Those exposures were higher than what we would have, would have expected for 2,4-D. Um, we don't, we are unable to, to know um, how they relate to other to atrazine. The two, the two pesticides that we're able to test for were 2,4-D and atrazine. And we can compare 2,4-D 
to a larger national sample, but we can't compare atrazine to a larger national sample. So the second box up there is the comparison of those spring samples of 2,4-D and atrazine and the fall samples of 2,4-D and atrazine. Okay, so if you look at the first line, you'll see that the average concentration of 2,4-D in those samples, in those 39 samples, was 4.9 micrograms per liter. Compared to the fall sample, where it was 0.37 micrograms per liter, that number, see it says less than 0 0.001, that's a, st a significance test. And that tells you the likelihood that this occurred by chance or not. And so the smaller the number, the less likelihood that it occurred by chance, that there, it is actually a true difference between the levels found in the fall and the levels found in the spring. And the reason that this is important is because in the fall and in the spring, um, the use of 2,4-D and atrazine is quite different. 2,4-D and atrazine are not applied in the fall. So we would expect those levels to be lower. They are applied in the spring, so seeing them as higher, that tells us that we're seeing what we would expect to see in terms of, of variability. Um, but it also tells us that we saw some fairly significant exposures in the spring compared to the fall. I'm going to be repeating myself here a little bit. We can only test, in urine, we can only test for 2,4-D and atrazine. That's because the, the, the lab methods <coughs> only exist. Um, they do exist in some private labs for other pesticides, but for the laboratory that we were using, which was the National Laboratory, they only exist for 2,4-D and atrazine. So that's all we can test for in urine. In, in environmental media, water, soil, food, we can test for a whole range of other pesticides. And this is how we did it. Um, some of this you've seen before. For the biologic testing um, in the fall samples, ATSGR did the collection, the National Laboratory did the um, analysis for the community collected um, uh, urine samples, Peace Health was where the collection was done, and Anatech Laboratories, excuse me, uh, and, um, excuse me, and Emory University was where the analysis was done. For the environmental data, um, the EPA coordinated with, with, uh, with us to collect uh, um, the soil, food, um, and lo local foodstuffs, and drinking water samples, and those uh, samples were analyzed by DEQ, ODA, and EPA. Uh, the community collected uh, environmental data were collected by community members um, with quality assurance, um, very specific quality assurance measures taken, and were analyzed by Anatech Labs. The application data, um, and again, we're thinking of the application records actually as a data source because it helps us to kind of fill up the picture. ODA and ODF did a tremendous job, a very big job, um, along with the, um, the companies that were supplying those data um, to get us the application data for three years. We compiled all that data and um, <coughs> <clears throat> to answer the questions that we're looking at today. So, um, what we learned uh, was that in those environmental samples of well water, surface water, and soil, we found very low concentrations of DEET, hexazinone, and fluoridone glyphosate, 2,4-D, and, and I say glyphosate already. Um, and there was, there were, there was one uh, detection in some error data that was collected, and that um, identified chlorpyrrole as a concentration, as a, as a um, pesticide present in some error data. The community collected data for water um, found concentrations of atrazine, um, two metabolites, one metabolite for atrazine, hexazinone. Um, in the, the water samples, we'll talk a little bit more about um, the use of the, the community collected water data in just a little while. Okay, so what we were able to conclude here was that um, the, sp the spring urine data and the fall urine data both had 2,4-D. Atrazine was not present in the fall data. In the um, environmental data, 
and just read them off to you, but there they are again. Very low levels of, levels of deep fluoridone, sazonone in drinking water. Uh, some low levels of 2,4-D in glyphosate in soil. And some very low levels of chlorpyrrolin in air. Okay. So the levels here, um, I'm going to turn to Dave here in just a second. The, the concentrations of pesticides found in different media, urine, water, soils, um, foodstuffs, the way that we understand how to interpret those data are by um, comparing them to something else, right? So for the urine data, we need to be able to compare them to two things. We want to compare them to, uh, from the exposure to how do these levels compare to other groups, right? <coughs> NHANES, the National Health the Nutrition Examination Study is a very large, ongoing, um, multi-state, multi-year examination of all kinds of things, um, including um, cholesterol and all kinds of things. People are tested for all kinds of things. They're also tested for um, environmental exposures. So we compared the fall 2011 samples to the NHANES. We also compared, it's not up here, and I apologize for that, we compared, the, and this is just for 2,4-D, okay? Atrazine is not tested in the NHANES group, so we don't have a national sample that we can compare for atrazine. We only have a national sample that we can compare for 2,4-D. In the, in the fall 2011 samples, the way that you read this is that, um, Okay, the 95th percentile is that top brown strip. And that says that 95% of the time, 95% of the people had concentrations in their urine above 1.27 micrograms per liter. Right? Less than. I'm sorry. Less than. It says greater than. Greater than 1.27. Well, 5% are greater than. 5% are greater than. Five, five, right, okay. Five. You want to do this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Why don't you do this and then maybe you can do it. That's not to so me. Sorry. Okay, so as Jay was saying, that, that top strip is. 5% of the people in the national study were had concentrations greater than that 1.27 micrograms per liter for 2,4-D. 20% of the U.S. population had concentrations between that 0.24, 1.27, and 25% between 0.2 and 0.23, and, and so on down. And then what you see in the column to the right is what we found in the fall um, urine data from the participants, from the 64, 66 participants um, in that group. So uh, in that case, there were 6% instead of 5% above the 1.27. So that, that was not, that top percentile was not different between the U.S. population and, uh, and the folks here. Uh, when you look at the group that's between 0.24 and 1.27, um, instead of 20%, there were 56% of, of this gr local group that were within that range. Um, and, and, that was, and, that, and that was different. So, so there was a difference in kind of that middle group of where, um, where people fell out. Um, in this, for spring 2011, um, that was the, the community collected urine data. Um, the, if we were to add a bar to the right there for that, it would look very different. The, in that group, almost all of it would be, would be that top gray, where uh, everybody in that group was over the 75th percentile. So, um, so, so almost everybody was over that, um, I think it's 0.24. Yeah, and then, uh, and then a few people um, were below that, but, but everybody was over the 1.27. Uh, no. In English. Right. So, so uh, 
basically, basically all of the samples in the fall 2011 were, were higher than what we would have expected from most people in the United States overall general population. So that's, so that's what we know about uh, 2,4-D. Okay, so for atrazine, um, NHANES, that same national study, actually does measure some, metabol some metabolites of atrazine. They look for atrazine itself and for, and for one, um, so metabolites. Uh, when you eat something or, or any chemical comes into your body, um, a lot of chemicals get broken down into different chemicals once by the different processes in your body. So if you, if you swallow atrazine and you, then you measure urine, you won't, find, you won't find any atrazine. What you'll find are these different breakdown products of, of atrazine. And there's lots of different ones for atrazine. We're, we're lucky in the case of 2,4-D in that um, it, it doesn't get broken down in that same way, so it, it comes out the same way that it goes in. So it's much simpler to analyze for 2,4-D. Um, with atrazine, um, because there's so many metabolites, um, uh, CDC didn't start out um, measuring all of those different metabolites. They, they, picked, uh, they picked two that they thought would be reasonably likely to show up and, and, and went with that. Um, later on, it was discovered that those two metabolites are not the most common ones. They're not the most abundant. So they sort of they sort of picked the wrong, in a way, they sort of picked the wrong ones to, to look for. Later on, um, they do, they've developed methods since then to measure some of the more um, more abundant um, breakdown products. And those are the all those sort of alphabet soup in the in the fourth column. Uh, to the right there are the names of these different um, metabolites that they tested for. Um, so, because that's a new test at ATSGR, we don't, have, um, we don't have national data to compare against for those analytes that, that were tested for in the spring or fall um, 2011 urine data. So that's what we mean, that we can't compare. We don't have, we, we can't tell how um, the folks here compare with everybody else in terms of accuracy, like we can for 2,4-D. Um, and so, because there's not a big national study, I sort of looked through this, the peer review, the, the scientific literature to find studies where people have measured um, and published um, results for these same metabolites that were measured here. And, and these are the ones that I found. There may be, this isn't probably in a, a complete list. These are the ones that I could find and, and I put in the report. So there was a, a study in France, in the Brittany region of France. And they, all of the participants in the study were, were pregnant women. And, like, and, and the ends, you see that N equals 579. That's how many people, that's, that's how many people were in the study. So there were 579 women in that study. Um, the median level is 1.2. So median is sort of like an average, except that um, the, the median means that half of the values are below that number and half of the values are above that number. So it's a little bit different than an average, but um, we use it sort of the same way. Um, right, so the, the median was 1.2, and then compare at the, the bottom row is at the Highway 36 spring samples, see that the median there was 4.8. So 1.2 versus 4.8. And then the far right column is the range. So uh, for the French women study, that means that the, a lot of the samples were non-detect, so it was low enough that they couldn't find it, they couldn't see it with the laboratory methods they were using, and the, the maximum was 17.1. So that's how to read the, the table. Um, Dr. Dana Barr um, published a study where, and uh, you know, the, the weakness of this is that it's, uh, it's small. The, the, you can see the ends there compared to the first one. Rather than 579, there's only eight, eight people. And, and these eight people were, um, were actual pesticide applicators. They were people who she, she expected to have, to have atrazine in, in their system. And, uh, and, and so she didn't report the median, but she said the range of those eight was 100 to 510. 
Michael Jones believed. Um, and that she had another group in, this, in the same study, she found some other people, volunteers who were not occupationally exposed, but who sort of like lived around, uh, around applicators. And, um, and their range was 10 to 235. So you can see, you can, so you can compare both the median and also the, the range um, of the Highway 36 uh, folks and against these other studies. So, um, you, you can't, uh, it's hard to make too much of it because these studies are, like I say, are not, they're not like nationally representative. I mean, one is from France and, and the other one is from people who are known to be exposed. So, but I just wanted, we just wanted to include that so there was some context for what, um, how the numbers compare with other groups. Were the French women tested because they were suspected of having some? No, it was a, that was a, a, a big national study in France, okay. sort of, it was just surveillance, sort of. Okay, so, out of all of what you just heard, the conclusions that we were able to draw is that <clears throat> those spring samples, those urine samples that were collected by the community in the spring of 2011, that those, uh, those samples indicated that residents had a higher um, higher level of 24G than the general population. In the fall, the samples that the investigation uh, collected, um, they had higher levels of 24D, but they were not statistically significant, statistically significantly different than the U.S. population. Um, but in the spring, the urine samples um, had detectable levels of atrazine, but as Dave was just describing, we couldn't, we cannot compare um, uh, so the levels are unknown um, by comparison to the U.S. population. Okay, so the sources. What are the sources? So this is where the pesticide application data become very important. Um, we were able to identify four sectors um, in this area, agriculture, forestry, roadside maintenance, so ODOT, and then you know, how they total out. And we were able to plot them, <clears throat> excuse me, over time, uh, beginning uh, between January 2011 and December of 2011. It's not a surprise. Um, forestry is very well represented here, um, so it makes up the largest um, proportion of the applications, about 80% of the applications, um, and um, the, the, the significant, most significant uh, amounts, so in terms of gallons. Agriculture um, coming in um, pretty close to the roadside maintenance um, levels. So again, it's pretty reflective of this community and the kinds of um, agricultural businesses that are going on here. You'll see that those seasons that we that I was descri describing earlier, um, that late spring time frame, uh, a little bit in March, much mostly in April, begins to fall off in May. Still some, still some in June. Um, and then there's the, the next season, that August, September, October. Right? So it's again, you know, you see that that um, pretty normal distribution uh, of what we expect to see. These are the areas. Um, the blue dots represent the um, sort of the middle, the, the between 51 and 100 uh, air acres treated, and then the yellow, the white dots are between 100 and 180 acres treated. Um, so it's definitely right in that area, um, <clears throat> right around, excuse me, excuse me, trying to wait. Um, the, the chart over here, one of the things that the chart shows, and this is going to be important in just a minute, is that um, the applications of, of 2,4-D and atrazine, the things that we can test for, did not begin until April and May of that year. We see a, a little bit of application happening, but that was for glyphosate, hexazinone, and sulfate. I can't say it. Sulfometron methyl. Thank you. Sulfometron methyl. Um, and in, in significant quantities, you know, there are significant amounts of pesticides being applied. Um, not, and it's not unusual. This, this community is not unusual compared with others. Okay. So, again, we're going to go back to those urine samples that were collected. There were 39, and this is how we began to understand and compare what we see in those 39 to what we saw in the application records. So, there were so the community that collected the data, the folks that um, participated in the urine sampling didn't actually know 
when applications were occurring. They, what they told us was that they went and gave their samples when they thought an application was happening or when they, they thought that no applications were happening. Um, in, in many instances, they were incorrect. So what, what they may have thought or what the investigator at, at Emory thought um, sometimes bore out and in many cases did not bear out. So there were 13 of the urine samples that were collected. As we looked at the application records, they were collected before any reported application happened. Okay? So that left 26 samples that occurred after we know that applications were occurring, 29 sa 39 samples in all. Of the, the 13 samples that were taken before any known application was occurring, there were detectable levels of atrazine <clears throat> and 2,4-D in those samples. This is, the, this is what, okay, in the report, did I remember I said it's draft? I'm going to correct this. In the report that you have, some of you have in your hands, um, I think it's on page 28 if you want to look for it. Um, we refer to these, we refer to these um, samples taken before a known application as baseline. That's actually really not correct. A baseline, you know, in fact, is something that you take when you know that there are no applications occurring, right? Um, we assumed that there were no applications occurring, so we kept referring to them as baseline. And then as we thought about it, we thought, more correctly, it's better to refer to them as applications or urine samples that were collected before a known application. Okay. So, so there were 13 samples taken before any known application and 26 samples taken after. So that first top two box on the left if you look at the atrazine concentrations. So there really is no difference in the concentrations of urine collected before, for atrazine, before there were known applications and after. That 0.72, remember I said the smaller the number, the, lo the more likely that it didn't happen just by chance. So 0.72 tells us that, that we can't make that claim, right? Um, so this is not, there's not a statistically significant difference between those levels. And the same thing is true for atrazine. Again, comparing the 13 samples collected before any known application and the 26 samples after known application, 5.4 versus 4.7 with a p-value of 0.63 says there's not a statistically significant difference. Okay. Okay. So then we look at the nine, there were nine samples that were collected within 24 hours of a known application. All right. So we took the application records, we know when they were applied, the urine samples, we know when they were collected, and there were nine that were actually collected within that very short window of time. And the reason that that's important is because these chemicals metabolize, remember Dave was talking about metabolites, they metabolize very quickly. And so the, within 24 hours, between within 72 hours, they are reasonably undetectable in urine. All right, so that 24-hour window is a really important time frame. Okay, within there were there were nine samples collected within 24 hours of a known application, and 30 samples, again 39 as a whole group, that were not they were collected not within a 24-hour window, and the difference between the concentration in the 24-hour window and the not 24-hour window is statistically significant, right? So there we would say we've got a, a temporal relationship, right? We've got a time-oriented time relationship between that. We see that for atrazine. We don't see that for 2,4-D, right? It's lower in the not 24-hour window, 7.2 versus 4.4, but that number, that 0.23, that's too big to tell us it's, it, it is actually statistically significant. Okay. okay, so <clears throat> this is what a normal correlation slope looks like. This is not our data. And I just wanted to show you, because what, what happens when you get a bunch of data and you're trying to decide, is this, is this data doing something? Is there actually a relationship between one thing and another? 
um, you draw a line through it and you see what the slope of that line is and that tells you if there's a, if there's a statistical uh, relationship. This is what our data look like. They're all clustered around. There's no perceivable slope between that. And what we did was we, we took the urine concentration is on this side, on the, what's called the y-axis, and um, a calculation of the, the number of gallons applied, the distance that that application was from the person who we collected the data from, and, and the amount of time that, that elapsed between that application and, um, and the sample. And because, I mean, that's, that's essentially what we're looking for here, is if pesticides are applied in the environment and they're moving, and they're moving in such a way, they have to move a distance, and they have to move a distance in a certain amount of time, and if they're getting into somebody, they, you know, the amount that's being applied should have some bearing on whether or not it will actually get into somebody. How quickly it will move and how, how far it will move. And we're not seeing a relationship. So we see a relationship in terms of time, just in that small group of nine, but we're, when we calculate it out, we're not seeing that relationship hold out to the whole 39. Again, it's not just the nine, but we look at all 39. Okay, <clears throat> so um, we were, we are unable at this point to confirm that those local applications that we know about, that those are are in fact the source for the pesticides found in urine. But when we look at when they were applied and we look at the time relationship, that 24 hour window, <coughs> pardon me, is, a, is, a, is an important piece of evidence. And so we say it could be. We're not saying it is, we're saying it could be. The, the uh, additional conclusion, again in the final, um, that we're gonna add is that those 13, those 13 are a real head scratcher. They present a, a real puzzle because we know that pesticides were not, we did not get a report of pesticides being applied, and yet we found concentrations of atrazine uh, in those urine samples. We can't explain it. Just a second. We're going to get to questions. Okay. Um, oh, I should have said that. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to yak at you a little bit longer. We'll take a break. We're going to, um, you'll have a chance to write your questions down. We're going to go back for a QA. Okay. <clears throat> so these are the routes. I think you might have seen this before. These are all the different ways that um, you know, chemicals are in our environment. We can breathe it in, we can drink it in, we can, it can touch us. Um, so it's either an ingestion, an inhalation, or a dermal pathway. The pathways that we looked at here, um, we considered aerial applications of pesticides. We know that that has been a concern for folks here. We know that pesticides are applied in the area. Um, we know that they're applied uh, to ground applications, and we know that they're applied through aerial applications. Um, the, 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 the transport, um, in the media for that would be that movement through the air. People would be outside, they would breathe it in. That would be the mechanism by which people could be exposed, could have been exposed in the past, could be exposed in the present, or, or in the future. So when we look at the, the inhalation pathway, um, there's that direct, there's you know maybe pesticides when they're applied, they're moving, they're drifting, they're moving through the area, people are breathing them in. There's also, people have um, suggested that because there's a lot of fog, there's a lot of moisture in the area here, that those chemicals that have been applied and have actually settled onto the ground, maybe were applied onto the ground, never weren't even necessarily applied through the air, could be re-volatilized, right? So could be taken back up into, the, into, into you know, small droplets and moved through the air in that way. Again, that's an inhalation pathway. The other pathways, surface soil, that would be your things around the, on the um, uh, ground, you're working in the soil, we, but we tested uh, that and we'll kind of go through what we what we feel like we've been able to eliminate in terms of exposure, in terms of soil and homegrown foods and, um, and also in terms of drinking water. Those are all the exposure pathways that we looked at. <clears throat> at this point, 
the major gap in our knowledge still is related to air. We have not been able to test air. We have not had the, the means or the methods, um, uh, resources at this point to test air. Um, we have tested drinking water. Um, we feel confident that groundwater is not a source for exposure. Um, we, um, we have not completely eliminated the possibility of surface water. Um, some of you are on, many of you are on, I guess all of you are on private drinking water wells. Um, some, most of you have your water that's being drawn through groundwater. Groundwater is very deep. It's not likely to change from one season to the next. Surface water could um, as the seasons change. Um, we've been able to eliminate for the fall um, of 20, uh, 2011, um, we were able to eliminate soil and foodstuffs as a potential uh, source of exposure for the concentrations that we found in urine. Okay. Um, you ready to come back up? We're talking about biomonitoring equivalents here. The ways that we know, uh, again, if uh, something could be a, a source of concern is being able to compare what is found in either in a person's body or in an environmental media to what are known health uh, levels of risk, right? So um, that's why I'm asking Dave to come up, because he's going to explain to you the difference between a, a biomonitoring equivalent and a, and a reference dose, right? So, um, the way that we know, so generally speaking, um, it, it, we'd always prefer to have less chemicals than than any chemicals, right? I mean, no, none would always be better than 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 some, but. Um, in toxicology, we do try to look for constant, for doses of chemicals that that we know would be harmful, and we try to find we try to find a, a dose that that is associated with low risk, or a, a dose that we wouldn't associate with any harm, uh, harm likely. Um, and you know that we we, we the, the thing that we say oftentimes is that, that the dose makes the poison. You know. Of, of, uh, a couple of aspirin pills will cure a headache, but a bottle can put you in the emergency room. So uh, most people sort of, it sort of makes sense when you think of it in that way. Um, so the way that the reference doses are determined is by, uh, usually by testing animals. And so there, there is some dose that they give to the animal that is, that they, that some, something happens. They, 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 they dose the, the, the rat with something, and then something happens to the rat, or it doesn't. And uh, the, the problem with um, applying that kind of information to urine data is that uh, the, the way that that's set up is that they don't usually measure uh, what's in the urine of the rat or what's, what's actually inside the body of the rat. They, they, they give an oral dose to the rat and so they know, well, this is how much we gave to the rat um, per body weight of rat, but we don't know what urine concentration in that rat correlates with that dose. So what, what scientists are trying to do, and, and have been successful in some cases, and 2,4-D is an example where it has worked out, um, they can, there's, there's a pretty complicated field of science called um, uh, let's see, PDPK, pharmaco, pharmacodynamic, physiologically based pharmacokinetic Right. It, so we say PVPK. <laughs> um, but, but what it really means is that um, through a series of sort of mathematical models, you try to you try to, to calculate how much try to calculate how much how much of that chemical you would expect to see in the urine of an animal or a person. It, well, a person um, if they were being if they were taking in the reference dose. So they, they have they we develop a reference dose. Where, like I said, we're, we're, we're based on the animal data, where we don't believe that there's a, a high risk to health if you if you consume up to that dose over a lifetime. Um, so they assume, say you eat that at, right at that dose for your whole lifetime. They use this modeling to sort of calculate what the urine concentration would be, and and that's 
how they develop these biomonitoring equivalents. And so, so that's what we have for 2,4-B. For there is a biomonitoring equivalent. Um, and so we were able to apply that biomonitoring equivalent to the urine data that we had. And, and none, of the, uh, none of the urine samples from fall or spring of 2011 were higher than the biomonitoring equivalent. So that would suggest that, um, that no, one was, no one was being dosed with 2,4-D um, at levels higher than the reference dose. Okay, now, now there, there are caveats there in that this is always a snapshot in time, right? It's, it's only reflective of the, do of the exposure that's happening at the time that the sample is collected. And, and, like, and as Jay said, these pass through the body pretty quickly. So, um, so within 72 hours, um, you, you might not see anything after you've, you've had an exposure. Um, Right, and, and the reason that we, so we haven't been able to do that same kind of comparison for atrazine metabolites because there is no biomonitoring equivalent. There is a reference dose, so, so we know what oral dose is associated with, with, with harm or no harm, but, um, but they have not been able to, to, to sort of back calculate what the urine concentration is associated with that reference dose. What, just, what Dave just described, that the, um, the levels of 2,4-D measured in, in um, folks' urine um, in the spring and the fall were below levels expected to cause harm. That's very good news. Um, what he also just said, um, uh, because we don't have a biomonitoring equivalent for atrazine, um, and we don't have environmental media tested that tell us concentrations, what people would be getting dosed with atrazine, we were unable to say what those levels of atrazine mean in terms of, of harm to health. However, um, we don't believe at this point that uh, drinking or contacting domestic water um, would uh, cause harm um, or contact with soils or consuming gar garden vegetables. So if those have been concerns here, um, we feel confident that, that, that those media um, are safe to consume, that it's safe to consume your drinking water, to continue to consume your garden vegetables, and, um, uh, and you know, other homegrown food, unless, of course, you use pesticides on your garden vegetables, and we would encourage you, if you do use pesticides, to make sure that they're thoroughly washed and consumed. Okay. Um, so some folks have asked, and we know that there have been some concerns raised about um, some observed health issues in, in the community. We have not, at this point, done a systematic health outcome data review for this community for the reasons that are, are listed up here. Um, we don't have confirmation of a completed exposure pathway at a level of concern. We know that we've, we've been able to detect 2,4-D in urine and atrazine in urine, but we don't have confirmation that they're at levels of concern. Um, it, within this community, we don't have, we don't know exactly which population we would be looking at. We don't know where we would be looking um, at specific people. Um, and just what Dave was just describing in terms of the both reference doses and, and bio, biological equivalent. And then the fourth bullet is probably one of the more um, important issues to address here. Pesticides of concern, I know people always think about, the three things that people think about um, when it comes to environmental exposures are cancer, um, birth outcomes, either um, all kinds of birth outcomes from um, miscarriage to low birth weight to um, birth defects of some kind. Um, <clears throat> in order for us to compare any community uh, to the rest of Oregon, say, um, we would need to look to existing data or look at cancer data, look at um, um, uh, birth outcome data. And that may be something that we, we will do in the future um, when we pass this threshold, which at this point we have not. Um, 
And that's not to say that we are um, not aware of the concerns that folks have here. It's just at this point that we haven't reached that, we haven't reached that threshold. It is also really difficult, um, not difficult like too hard or not smart enough or we don't care enough or something like that, but to, when you try to compare a very small community to the rest of the state, say, for a particular kind of cancer or a particular kind of birth outcome, the small numbers in a, in a, in a small community compared to a larger community make the, the statistics that we would use to make that comparison very unstable, very unreliable. And so we might, we might, using the statistics, we might, we might conclude that there is not a health outcome of concern when that might not be the case at all. Um, or we might conclude that there is and we would not be, we wouldn't be on very firm footing to say that because again the statistics are a little bit unreliable when you start trying to compare small numbers. That's, that is definitely something that's still in the work plan though and, and when we get a little further down the road we can talk more about that but I just wanted to check in with you on that. Okay, so in terms of the investigation overall, you guys have been really patient. Thanks for hanging in here with me. Um, this is what we can say, what, what we've heard already in terms of conclusions um, are what we feel very confident about, but some of, the, some of it we're not as confident about. And these are the things that introduce some uncertainties and some limitations. Um, <clears throat> the community collected data are very important to this investigation. We feel very confident having done um, our due diligence to determine that the quality of the collection uh, the transportation and the analysis was sound, um, but it didn't have the same level of government oversight that the urine collected in the fall did. That's just sort of one thing. Um, it's also important to note that we only tested for 2,4-D and atrazine. We know that there are a number of other pesticides that are in use in this community, um, so that's, that's another limitation. Interesting. The conclusions that we're drawing, as Dave pointed out, the samples that we took, there were snapshots in time. Right? So that really knowing, being able to say with certainty that if we had taken samples on a different day around the time that those pesticides were applied, we might have gotten different results. We also know, I think it's called the Hall for um, anything that, be, that is aware of, its, of itself as being observed changes. We're just human nature, right? <coughs> Don't think of an elephant, right? What's the first thing you do? Think of an elephant. Human nature, that's the way our brains work. Um, it's called the Hawthorne effect. And it says, basically, once something is aware of being observed, its behavior changes. And it, we, we don't know if pesticide application practices changed here once the investigation began. And there's also um, a growing body of evidence that suggests that we don't know as much as we should know about when you are when a person is exposed to multiple pesticides. The way we've described this so far, we've talked about 2,4-D and the biomonitoring equivalent and atrazine and the comparison group, right? So we're talking about these, these chemicals one at a time. Um, there is evidence that says there is a, what's called a synergistic effect. Sometimes that means that they could enhance one another in terms of the impact. Sometimes there's an antagonistic effect, and one can actually downregulate the other. We don't really know at this point what those effects are. Um, but there is evidence that says that they're not a straight linear effect, right? It's not just more, more, more creates higher and higher <coughs> levels of problem. You know, there's a, there's a slope to these things. And that, that, Science is growing, but it's, it's, um, it's still very much in early development stages. Okay. I recognize that this is not, and it's not any of our community. And so, these two conclusions, I guess, in a way, they're, I, 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 I don't know, I'm a we've been We've been with you now for a couple of years. 
And we've been listening to you in these meetings. We've been listening to you out of these meetings. We've been listening to you in small groups. We've been listening to you in email. We've been listening to your advocates. We understand how challenging the situation is for your community. And remember, this is an Oregon Health Authority report. The Oregon Health Authority cares very deeply about your health. For whatever it is that could be causing you ill health. Community, communities that are in conflict are difficult places to live. In. And especially rural communities. And I'll just tell you something, not to get not to, you know, share too much information. I live in a little tiny town on top of a mountain in Columbia Gorge. And I know how important my neighbors are. Conflicts that happen in very remote and rural communities are particularly problematic to the health of the people who live in those communities because we are so reliant on one another. It's very concerning to me and to the rest of the investigation team the degree of conflict that has that this situation has engendered within your community. Because it's not good. It, re it reduces social capital. Social capital is the stuff that the Boy Scouts gives you. It's the stuff that neighbor to neighbor helping one another out happens to you. It's the stuff that happens when I'm driving up the mountain and I see someone stopped on the side of the road. I always stop because you're that far out. You don't pass people on the side of the road. You know? That is something that is it's, it's going on in this community. And, it, and it's, it's erupting out of this question of whether or not pesticides are a problem here. But when we listen to you, it sounds like conflict that's much more fundamentally about land use, property rights, pesticide use. And those are things that this investigation is not going to fix. You know, we heard at the last meeting some really, for me it was very touching sentiments about how when you talk to each other about the degree of divisiveness that has taken hold here. And the ways in which you as a community really have to find a way to resolve this. This investigation is not going to resolve this for you. We will try, because we are in the Health, in health Authority, we very much want to know. And we will get as far as we can to answering those six questions. Or we will find out that they are not knowable. They are not answerable. But we are not going to stop, because we really do need to know if pesticides being applied here are getting into people's bodies at, at levels that can cause harm. But those other questions about land use, pesticide use, property rights, those are things that you guys have to resolve here. So the conclusions, the last two conclusions, are very much directed to this issue. And again, I, I, I feel, I don't know, I feel a little funny talking about it, but um, I can't not talk about it um, because it's so evident. And, and it, is such a, it is such a concern. So these are the things that we still know. We don't know, we only know about environmental sources, um, again, surface water, foodstuffs, soil. We don't know if we took um, samples of those environmental media during the winter season, if we might find concentrations of those pesticides. We know that in the fall, we didn't find it. But we don't know if the season's changed, will we find it in the winter. We do not know how to explain those 13 samples. Those samples that were taken before there was a known or reported pesticide application, but where we found concentrations, significantly high concentrations of atrazine, or not statistically significantly different than the concentrations of atrazine found after there were known atrazine. We don't know how to explain that. We don't know if air is a significant exposure pathway. We haven't been able to test the air. And we don't know yet if there are higher than expected um, health concerns in this community. So, we've got some recommendations. Related to this exposure investigation, we're recommending that US EPA develop a sampling plan for air monitoring. We're recommending that ODA and ODF continue to make application records, pesticide application records available to the investigation. 
And um, this is not a small investment of, of resources. So all the state agencies, both, um, excuse me, all the agencies, both state and federal, really need to identify a plan for seeing this investigation through, including the resources needed to do it. Now, beyond this investigation, um, one of the things that we found, remember that grid with the little boxes, orange and yellow boxes? That data came in, um, those pesticides, the pesticide application rules and requirements were built not for this kind of investigation. They were built to make sure that pesticide applicators were being compliant and for a kind of a one-off, right? We've got somebody who's made an application somebody's complained about, the pesticide regulatory agency will go out, work with that pesticide applicator to look at the records. It was never meant for this kind of a broad scale data collection effort. It probably needs to be. Because this is an important kind of, of investigation. And it needs to be done in a way that's not onerous to the pesticide applicators. All right, we're not trying to make anybody's life any harder than it is. We all work hard, you know, life's challenging. Um, but we need to come up with a system so that the record keeping is consistent. We can't, the data came in in very different ways. And it took us, you might know, wonder why it took us all that time to come up with this report. A lot of it was getting that application record data into a form that we could use for this, um, for this analysis. Again, the state and federal agencies developed an implementation plan. And we would really suggest that you as a community, that perhaps if there's some core group of folks in the community that are I don't know, informal leaders, that you consider seeking the help of. There are some really terrific mediation groups um, out there. They work with communities on this very kind of issue. Your community is not unique and I'll, in that way. I'll tell you, I spent a year and a half, two years working in the eastern community, in eastern Oregon, where communities were very concerned about the, the existence of the planting of wind turbines in their community. Um, communities grapple with these things. And, and sometimes they tear communities apart because people have really different values around the things that are, whether it's windmills or pesticides. Um, so there are community, community mediation groups that work with communities on, on kind of resolving some of these issues. So we really recommend that you consider that. Um, what we're going to do from here, we're going to take all your public comments. Uh, if you get them to us before the ju July the 9th, we will finalize this report. Remember, this is an interim report. This is not the final, final report. This will be the final of the interim. Um, and we'll report, report, uh, complete that report, um, including responding to the comments that we receive. Um, we're going to work with you all, with the state, other state agencies and federal agencies to implement the recommendations that we've made. We're going to continue to communicate with you um, as actively as we have through electronic media, through listserv, um, and our webpage. We are going to finish the analysis of those two other years. Again, the, we had asked for three years, but we, got to, uh, we only got through the analysis of one. We'll continue to um, do that comparison. <clears throat> EPA, hopefully, will be able to move us ahead on the air sampling. Elizabeth is going to come up here in just a minute and talk about that. Um, and then when, when we get through all of that, we will, we will produce one more report, which we believe at that point will be the final final. So, do you want to come up here and talk about the, where EPA is with the air sampling? Um, I think it's important to, to first start this out with a disclaimer. Um, I'm not a chemist. I don't know a lot about air chemistry. My day job is that I'm a toxicologist. And I'm a toxicologist um, in the Superfund program at EPA. And I guess that's relevant for this particular uh, little investigation in that one of the things we do in the Superfund program, which is trying to evaluate what's happening around sites that we know there's contamination present, is look for ways that people are being exposed. And so, with that background in mind, 
that's kind of how I got involved in this. I remember standing here three years ago, two years ago? It seems like dog years. <laughs> We were running this this slide presentation in two rooms, and the other room they didn't have your slides. Oh, okay. Um, how many people are over there, Alan? There are about 20. 20. Uh -huh. So, can I beg your indulgence one more time? Um, we were going to take a break um, right about here, um, give you a chance to ask some questions. That will give us a chance to copy your slides over into that side, and then we'll come back, we'll let Elizabeth finish her presentation, and then we'll go right into the Q&A. So give us about 15 minutes, there's some coffee over there. It's proven to be a little bit more daunting than, than we originally thought. And what you've seen with some of the investigation tonight and some of the challenges that we still face in the investigation and some of the challenges that we have come up with in trying to do air sampling is really what you're seeing is science in action. And when I say science in action, that means a lot of sitting around looking at research and sometimes seemingly not getting anything done. Um, I think the other advantage that I have where I don't get quite as frustrated as some of you might be is coming from the Superfund program. Um, that's a program by which you take, by comparing it to glacial time, uh, progress seems to be, look, um, in glacial time seems to be time-lapse photography. <laughs> So I'm, I'm used to having to spend a long time on a problem to see a result. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. And um, if at the end of this you're a little frustrated, uh, please bear in mind that we are making some progress and we're continuing. the office and um, I think we mentioned last year that we had planned to apply for some money. There's a, a, a grant that is given to, there's a, a pool of money and each of the regions based on their priorities can say we would like some money to do a specific investigation. It's called the Regional Methods Program. And so I put together a proposal um, I think at the time last year we had just submitted the proposal and we didn't know anything about what was going to happen. As I'm sure some of you are aware that on the listserv, uh, that proposal was accepted, it was funded, and so we put together a team of people to work on it. Uh, included in that team is people from EPA Region 10, um, myself included. I am the technical lead on the project. But there are a lot of other people involved, and um, any time that I stand here before you, I, I really need to, to give out some props to the person that I work for in Region 10, Sheila Fleming. She's my supervisor, and I cannot tell you how supportive she is of the work that I do and my involvement in projects like this. So um, I, it, it's important for you to know that uh, there's a lot of people within EPA and within Region 10 that have my back. So, The money itself comes from EPA's Office of Research and Development. And so I got some scientists in ORD, as we refer to it, because in EPA we are all about acronyms, to, to work on this project. And they come from uh, the site characterization, monitoring, uh, that's pretty weird, and technical support center. Don't hold them together. Synergistic? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I'm not going to read these, but you can see the different branches of R&D this comes from. Um, we've also managed to get some scientists that have experience in this type of sampling from Region 5. The contract to do this work itself is, is comes from EPA Region 4, which is in Atlanta, and is run out of EPA Region 3, which is in Philadelphia. So it's kind of a multidisciplinary task. The company to which we are having do the majority of this research, it's a contract that we issue, the company is Patel, but we are working very closely with people at the University of Washington. And the reason we're working very closely at the University of Washington is in all of my research, I came across a researcher there 
who has actually done this type of sampling. There is a big health investigation going on, looking at the health of people, farm workers that live in the Yakima Valley of Washington. And one of the things that they did was they developed a passive sampling method. They went out and measured concentrations of the, of the pesticide Clopyrifos in air. So since they've done a lot of that work, we want to take advantage of their knowledge. We're not interested in reinventing the wheel. If there's people out there that really know how to do this and know what they're doing, we want to rely on their skills. So just to give you a little background, why are we doing passive sampling? The reason is, is that because we don't always know when pesticides are going to be applied, when herbicides are going to be applied, where they're going to be applied, doing something that requires a mechanical device is problematic. A lot of the air samplers are quite big. Really, we can only run them for about 24 hours at a time, and then the sampling media becomes saturated. Um, the data becomes unreliable, and we really can't use the data. So if we have a simple device that we can just place in a location and leave it and have it collect data for us over time, we thought that would be a very handy way to do it. Really, it's a very simple, in theory, um, you can use uh, various things for sampling media. What we've settled on is, you see PUF, it's polyurethane foam. Literally, it's a disc of the type of foam that's probably in your sofa seat cushion at home. The reason this works is because the chemicals that are in the hair, they adhere more to the foam rather than stay in the air. And so they're attracted to this foam, they collect on it, and there's a period of time in which they collect on it and they don't leave. And so you'll see on that thing, the linear portion of that is the time that they're collecting on it and everything that's collected on it stays on that foam. If we start getting too much on the foam, then we get into what's called equilibrium in which every time a molecule of chemical lands on the foam, another one leaves. And we don't want to be in that particular part. We want to always be where we're collecting it on the foam we can, it's okay for us to get on the curved portion of that graph. The arithmetic is a little harder, but we can still do it. But one of the things that we need to investigate is how long can we deploy the sampler and still be on that straight line portion of the graph. I just threw this up here. That's the equation we use to do the calculation. You'll see somewhere in there, um, CA, that's, that's concentration in air. And if you're better at algebra than I was last night when I put this together, you can solve that equation for concentration in air. And so we can use that to take this technique and get a concentration in air. That's what one of the sampler looks like. It is, in fact, um, it's the foam disk that you see. We invert it so it keeps rain and dust from getting on the foam disk, and we leave it out in in the um, environment. Um, it could be for as long as 30 days. We don't know that yet. That's what they look like deployed. And that's a picture from the investigation in the Yakima Valley. You're seeing um, samplers at different, um, different heights, but also you're seeing some because one of the things that we've learned is we may lead to leave, a, we may have different samplers for different classes of compounds. There's a lot of different types of herbicides that are commonly used in this area. So there are some that we may need to leave out for only two weeks. There are some that we may, may need to leave out much longer than that. These are questions that we're still trying to answer and what's what our research is going to tell us. So where are we now? We got, like I said, we got this funded and the contracting officer actually allocated these funds for the project to, to go forward, and that was done March 1st. And that's a really important date, because on March 5th, the sequester took effect, and all grant funding was halted. So this got allocated, got committed, just in the nick of time. And uh, it's really important because we have really, really good people um, doing the contracting for us. So. We put together a draft statement of work, gave it to our contractor. They came back. We're still trying to work out some of the details on that. We, some things we don't quite see eye to eye on. There's a little bit of miscommunication. So we've just recently 
within um, the early part of May, received that bit of work back from the contractor. <coughs> we're commenting on it, and we're coming back with uh, a, a more tightly found way to, to move this work forward, um, which means in common English terms, no actual research has taken place yet. There's a lot of things that we still need to figure out. This is kind of a, a much more difficult challenge than I, than I planned on when we started this. One of the problems is, is that there's a lot of different analytical methods to be used for these particular different classes of herbicides. And in fact, um, I'm finding out that there is, for some of these herbicides, there is no standard EPA method. So there's methods developed by the manufacturers, we need to develop, for some of these, a way to, once we get this chemical off of the polyurethane foam, which is a kind of a fairly simple process, but then we need to run it through some sort of analytical technique and analytical instrument in order to get that concentration. So those are the other things we're gonna be working on. Um, there are so many different, these chemicals are such broad different classes. There's four particular classes of herbicides that are most frequently used here. They have very, very different physical chemical properties. And because they have different physical chemical properties, that may mean that we have to have a different sampler for different types of chemicals. And like I mentioned earlier, it may mean that we have to leave some of them out there for much longer than others. I just wanted to, to point out out there, KOA is, stands for octanol air partitioning coefficient, which tells you how much a chemical would rather be in octanol versus air. And those are log, logarithms, but what you're seeing is for every, every time you see a different integer, you're literally seeing a factor of 10. So when you, it's quite, quite a span. So those are some of the problems that we're, we're running into. Can you hold the mic a little bit further from your mouth? It's Thank really you. loud. Well, you're done. Right? I'm done. Oh, swell. Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we reached the point of our um, meeting tonight where we're going to begin to field some of the, um, some of the questions that have been raised. Uh, we have them on common cards. I will just say that because time is, and we're at 8.30, um, yeah. What I've suggested to the different agency folks that we've parsed them out to the different agency folks. If the if it doesn't look like a question, we're not going to answer it. If it looks like a statement or something, we're going to let that stand or give folks who have time allotted or, or um, asked for at the mic later. Um, we'll let you make your statements there. Um, so uh, for anybody got a, I got a question. I got one. I can answer. So why don't you guys pick, pick from your, pick a couple from your stack. I'm at a couple. Um, the first one, <clears throat> the first one I think I've got. Oh no, that was about, that was about it being boring to begin with, and so I'm gonna <laughs> go right. I'm just gonna scoot right past that one. Um, uh, someone raised the question about the deadline for public comments. Um, didn't realize that that ran. Of course, we realized about the Fourth of July, but didn't realize that. Um, that there are other festivals here that uh, folks here are very involved with, with and that that would create a hardship for this community. So we're going to extend the deadline, the uh, public comment period, by 30 days. So we'll move it out. We'll, we'll recalculate, come up with a new date, communicate that on the listserv. So it's less important to, to us that we get it done by July 9th, but that we give the folks an ample time to formalize their comments and, and get them into us. So um, <clears throat> I have another question. Um, uh, about the 2012 records, why haven't the, <coughs> me, why haven't the 2012 uh, application records been requested? Um, at this point, we don't have um, anything to compare them to. Uh, that we have, we have a small amount of um, uh, air data that the community collected uh, that we may want to compare it to application records, but over and above those air data, we don't have any reason to, at this point, have something to compare to the 2012. Um, <clears throat> why has it, oh, why hadn't we requested spray records prior to 2009? That's because 2009 was the three-year uh, time frame that 
before which applicators didn't have to keep the records. Ap applicators are required to maintain their records for three years. So we went back as far as we could go, and that didn't extend before 2009. Okay, anybody got a question? Okay, I've got two. The first one is, is there an NHANES type data available for pesticide levels in store-bought food, both organic and, and uh, non-organic, uh, we call that conventionally raised? Uh, and yes, the United States Department of Agriculture has what we call their market basket program and they pull out samples of foods from uh, both the fresh market and from uh, packers, and they check for what <coughs> pesticide levels they might be in there. And they actually put out a report every year um, as to what they found in all those different uh, sources. So if you really want to see that, get a hold of me, because I didn't come prepared to tell you where it was, but it should be on the web someplace. It's pretty easy to find. And the second one is, are there herbicides on organic and non-organic foods? Um, and so I'm going to say, are there, I, I'm implying, it, could they be used on organically raised crops as well as conventionally raised crops? And the answer is yes. There are pesticides registered for use on organic crops, and they may be used just like you may use some or you may not use some. Okay, we don't know specifically who uses what. Um, but generally, if you're going to find a commercially grown organic produce in a store, likely it's had some sort of a pesticide applied to it. And they've got to follow the same rules that everybody else does. And I don't care if it's an organic pesticide or a conventional pesticide, I'm going to enforce it the same way. They have to follow the same rules. My name is Link Smith, the Department of Forestry. Uh, I'm going to answer one of these questions here. Basically, refers to the current setbacks or boundaries from houses and uh, streams for chemical um, applications. Um, there is no, in our rules, there is no boundary designated for spraying within or around homes. Um, and for fish streams, fish and domestic streams, you can aerially apply herbicides within 60 feet or by ground spray, you can apply up to within 10 feet of those streams. And I do have a uh, kind of a forest fact sheet here that if anybody would like, I'd be glad to hand out, but it answers some of those questions maybe a little more thoroughly than I can do on a microphone here. So uh, please see me at a break, and I'd be glad to hand one of these out to you. So I'm David Fair with Oregon Health Authority. Um, one question here is asked, uh, did you compare cases where people drink from springs and creeks versus people drinking from, from groundwater? And uh, uh, if you remember, the, there were only three drinking water samples that had any um, detections for any of the pesticides that we tested for. And I remember in water, we were able to look for a much broader range of pesticides. I think it was a hundred and... Breaks here, it was something like 175 different pesticides that we looked for in water. And, um, and only found three, three samples that had one of those each, um, and, and, and at very low levels. So um, as far as comparing urine results of those three people, uh, none of the pesticides that were, none of those three were 2,4-D or atrazine. So, so we couldn't, couldn't match up the urine results with, um, with those samples in, in a meaningful way. Follow-up is deep. Uh, chemical use in agriculture or forestry? No, no. It's the uh, insect repellent that pretty much all insect repellents use, and we find it commonly throughout the state. Oh, thank you. Um, let's see. I have a lot, so I'll keep going. Um, another one said, um, will more self-collected data be admitted, possibly for air monitoring, um, for water monitoring? And I'm thinking that means like the community collected data. And I think, that, I, I think the answer is that, that we would. We've, we've done it before, and, and I, uh, the, the, the key, though, is that we need to have a lot of information about, um, up front, about like, how it was collected and what, uh, what measures were put in place to ensure the quality of the data. Um, it's not like you have to have a special degree or anything to, to 
collect data that is of high quality, but we just need to have documentation of how the data were collected and how they were analyzed and um, chain of custody between where they were collected and the laboratory and those kinds of things. So if other if people are wanting to do that, we we would we would admit it. We we would encourage you to talk to us first so that we can all be clear about like what kind of documentation we need um, in order for us to be able to use it. Um, when the data comes in. Okay. Um, get a good one then. All right. Is, um, oh, one of them that was good was uh, have we considered talking with uh, Tyrone Hayes about um, about atrazine? I think that that is a I've read I've read work I've, I've read papers by by Tyrone Hayes before and and uh, uh, that that is a, a, an expert in, in, in atrazine and we are always happy to talk to more scientists. We're, we don't have like a we don't have like a do not contact list or anything for any particular scientist. So we, we would be happy to, do, to, to talk to anyone who has expertise to offer. So. I'm Elizabeth Allen with UCA. Um, I've got a lot of questions and they all seem to, I've got two types, um, but they all seem to boil down into, into kind of a, a trend, shall I say. And this one, this is why why would it take so long to investigate chemicals already on the market, and wasn't it done before a chemical goes to market? And I'm, I'm going to focus on the, the pesticides and the herbicides because that's what we're talking about in this particular investigation. Anything beyond that is, once we very quickly get outside my, very, my area of expertise. And as I said, I, I work in Superfund. I don't work in the Office of Pesticide Programs. I've, interacted a lot with people from the Office of Pesticide Programs back in Washington, D.C. Um, as part of this investigation. They've been very involved in it. There is a process by which pesticides are registered. They could, there's, there are studies done on them, and there are requirements for information that need to be submitted to EPA, and that information is used, and whether or not the, whether or not it, the pesticide is allowed for use, how it's used, and uh, as you've heard discussions about 2003, 2004, and those are like kind of new, like since since February 2013. So it takes them a long time to to release the data. So they probably already have, you know, something written down. They're just not ready to to publish it yet. And it asks, would these num would these numbers would these results uh, be used to create that? And um, I, I suppose that we could we could ask them if they want them. Um, they they were the ones who tested the the uh, fall samples, so they have those already. Um, let's see. Oh, there was a, a few questions that all were kind of around the the earlier the spring 2011 um, urine samples that had atrazine that were collected prior to any known any known application and and where where those exposures came from. And the answer is that we don't know. I mean, uh, none of none of the data sources that we have available to us um, explain that. So um, it's, there's something, there's some kind of exposure that's outside of um, outside of any data sets we have to, to answer that question. So. Okay. Um, I was um, while we're talking about atrazine, I was just concerned that there are no of the, um, the biomonitoring equivalents, and it also seemed like the CDC didn't have good breakdowns of the metabolites, like how it acts in the body over time, so I'm wondering if there would be a recommendation to do some more research on that. Uh, I, I think that um, many people are interested in it. It's an active area of research already. It's, I, suppose that we, I suppose that we sort of limited the scope of our recommendations to agencies that are like within our influence. I mean, most of them are to other state agencies, and um, you, you, I mean, it's the, these are federal agencies that sort of determine the the direction and funding levels for different types of research. And I, I think that they're they're already they are putting resources toward that already. It, you know, t it's time takes time. <laughs> Science takes time, and time takes time. So. Okay. Um, am I up? Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Yeah. This is like he's a puppet master back here. This so it all happen. Okay. Well, thank you for um, your questions, for your um, very attentive attention so far tonight. The the part of the program that we where we have um, sort of anything specific that we want to say to you is now over. Um, we're going to move into uh, what we're calling the public speaking period of this. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that very deliberately as public speaking as opposed to calling it a public comment period because I want to make sure to reiterate that what's spoken here at this point was not going to count as public comment to the, um, to the public health assessment. So this is your opportunity to speak to one another. Um, actually, I think we're going to turn that mic around, pull it a little bit forward so that when you're speaking, um, we, we're here to listen and we will stay uh, for the remainder of the evening. Um, you are all free to stay or free to go as you like. Of course, you can free to go all night, but, you know, at this point. Um, but uh, we have 27, potentially 28, you need to check that out, um, folks who want to speak at the mic. Um, so if you do the math, um, that's going to take a very long time if folks don't limit their comments. So. Could I suggest that you share the airtime, uh, that you be as succinct as you can with, if you decide to, to take the opportunity to speak to the mic. Um, and I'm going to call you up one at a time. I see that someone over here has a question. I have a question about the written questions that people submitted. Uh -huh. If our questions did not get answered, will you be willing to uh, put them on an email or something and answer those questions? We could do it that way, and we could also include them as public comment, because um, we got them in writing. Okay. So, um, if we'll either address them, if they're immediate, we'll address them as we can on the listserv, um, but we'll take them and include them. Do you, we also have our cards available here so people can also That's right. can also contact, uh, you know, directly after the meeting or Yeah, I by think email. it would be really handy if there was a, a question that you submitted that didn't get directly answered. Um, if Feel free to come yeah. up and talk to us when we're done. Yeah. yeah. Or, okay. or email, whatever. Okay. Um, can I, can I get a road? Let's move this mic. I'm presuming that you intended this, right? Right. Oh. I'll find a picture for you. <coughs> you intended that we would be speaking towards the audience? Yes. Or towards yourselves? Towards the audience. That's fine. I can roll towards me, but. <coughs> Um, I mean, Adrian Kusmer, when I've been following this issue for close to 30 years, um, my entire family and many of our friends and much of our community has been made ill by herbicide. The only example I'll give is that of a family of five, um, uh, three of the people have been radically affected, including one 33-year-old woman who's had five abdominals, four abdominal surgeries in the last five years, all related to hormone issues, and there's still no conclusion as to what's going on with your health. I've collected a chronology over the last uh, 25 years of people in the Deadwood area that I know, just that I know, who have health issues. There are people here from all seat of mine. There's people here from Rochley, Gorton, everywhere else. I'll be happy to give you my email. Anyone who wants to tell me their story, I will be happy to video it or record it. I'm an audio and video producer. I want the Oregon Health Authority and Governor Kitzhaber to call a moratorium on all forestry pesticides until we can discover what is wrong. Let's operate in precaution rather than continued um, health crisis and concern. Um, the other thing that I would like to ask for tonight is that there be a widespread epidemiological study, health study, not just of what's in people's urines, but a long-term 30-year study from when Asian Orange was first used back in the late 70s till the present day to see what's actually going on in the greater area from, let's say, uh, Newport to Corvallis and then down in and around. And, just do it rurally. Just show, it's not that many population, let's find out. See if the community is willing to cooperate in this way 
so that we can actually see where the clusters are. That's my time up. <laughs> Appreciate that. Let's hear it for smartphones. Day. There you go. I moved the mic up a little bit so that no one gets their vision blocked. These are two aerial photographs uh, that were part of the Environmental Protection Agency tour of Highway 36 a couple of years ago. And so let's go ahead and unfurl uh, the first one. This one right here. I'm going to hold this up. And if you want to, you can move over to these empty chairs and, and see. I think it's a significant point. And while they're doing that, let me point out, you know the mysterious 13 people and how did they get atrazine in them? Here's an important fact that I found that most of the agencies represented here tonight weren't aware of, but a couple of them were, is that all of the local farmers here, and I've got nothing against you guys, and I don't think you're the problem. All of the local farmers here don't have to report their use of pesticides because the only people that have to do that are people that are hiring someone else to apply them. So if you want to know how those people in early spring or winter before the um, spray records that we have got atrazine in them, it would be difficult because any farmer here that has a big spread, virtually all the local farmers apply their own pesticides and don't hire an outside source, so they're not in the records that you're getting told about tonight. But what I wanted to show here is that this is the clear cut directly above my house. My house is there. And this is the spray that has sickened members of my family. Right at the bottom of this hill is the school bus where my kids had to go out one morning when they were woke up at 6.30 by the sound of loud helicopters and had to go out for the school bus. And my daughter Alina, who graduated as the valedictorian a couple years ago of Triangle Lake School, she went to school, but she got so sick at school that she had to come home and I immediately called Park. And Park didn't come out and check anything. They didn't investigate. And when time went by and I requested their official case record for her, it said that she was deemed that she wouldn't have been exposed because there was, quote, no known pathway. No possible way that at this bus stop, when helicopters flew over spraying pesticide, or at my house even, when she saw a cloud of the pesticide drift onto our property and cling to the trees, the park records, who never came out and checked, say there's no known pathway where it could have possibly happened. That's a quarter of a mile from my house. If you read the 100-page report for this investigation, you'll find out that all of these people that we're talking about that tested a certain amount positive that they averaged living two and a half miles from where the aerial spray occurred. And when they spiked after an aerial spray that was an average of two and a half miles from their house, their atrazine level spiked. And there's lots of studies, as the report confirms, that have historically documented this kind of long range drift. And yet, Park said there was no known pathway. So, my question, but I have a, another thing to show, is going to be, is this data, and we can show the other one now, is this data going to alter Park's practice? Because when I saw that happen to my daughter, I investigated their larger case files, and it turns out that everyone out here on Highway 36 over the years that ever filed a complaint, that the same thing gets said, no known pathway, no way that it could have happened. In all fairness, we now know how it probably happened. And I've got to point out that the companies that make the products that got found in us are on the board of directors of the group, you know, Oregonians for Food and Shelter that are here tonight. We're talking about, you know, Monsanto. We're talking about the sprays were done by Weyerhaeuser, the aerial sprays that we spiked after. The only politicians that have shown up at any of these Highway 36 investigation meetings, including tonight, have been ones that if you check the records, they've received lots of 
financial contributions from these timber companies, including Weyerhaeuser, for example, our commissioner, Jay Bozovich, all the people that make the pesticides are big contributors to the only politicians that have come to any of these meetings. This picture, this one is in Roseburg because this is a state problem. This man right here had a grape vineyard, Kevin Coleman. He ends up receiving a couple million dollar settlement, but when he makes the settlement with the companies that did the spray, he had to sign a document never to tell anybody that he'd made the settlement, that it had ever happened. But I know him and I know what happened. These blue lines, each one of them coming down to his grape vineyard, which had over a million dollars of damage, or excuse me, no, it was fi over $500,000 in damage, but he had to spend more than that going to court to try and prove it. When Park first came out to do the first investigation when he called, they found no sign of pesticides on his property. But because he then had a bottle of wine tested and found out it had the herbicide sprayed up there in his wine that he marks it from his vineyard, um, he hired private people to come in and test, and they found it right in his vines of his plant, um, in, in the wine he was producing and such as that. Because he was a wealthy vineyard owner, he was able to spend the over half million dollars it took to take it far enough to where industry um, paid him the couple million dollars but made him sign a thing never to disclose that it happened. What I want you to see is each of these blue lines was a different clear cut above his property and it states the distance um, that happened and it turns out that the one that was most responsible and most found in the materials was 1.47 uh, miles away, so almost two miles away. What happens, since no testing yet has happened to people that live actually, like my daughter was standing so close, you know? No testing has been done by any, on anybody like that. And out of all the data that got said here tonight, and there was a lot, probably the most telling is that you only are in that uh, nine people that showed the big spike and all that, if you got tested within 48 hours, but they say that usually when 24 hours goes by, most of it's flushed out and isn't going to be found. Almost everybody in this test was tested way out of those boundaries, and therefore the statistic you're being shown tonight, that it's at a harmless level, means nothing. So, as far as what I would call for tonight, is first of all, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I'm the founder of the Pitchfork Rebellion, which sounds scary. I authored the petition that led to this. And what I want to tell you is I really don't think it's the local farmer's fault. And the reason is, is because what we've seen in analyzing the satellite photography is that, like happened to Coleman and like happened to my daughter, almost every single incident that I know of of people that got real sick and went to park and got told no known pathway, Almost every one of them lives underneath one of these big clear-cut hills. And you fly a helicopter over and you spray and you shouldn't be surprised that they, they, they get exposed. So, my um, attempt of an olive branch to local farmers that are concerned how this might affect you, the fact is that you local farmers are like us, you're living down here on the flatlands. Not only that, but are any of you local farmers aerial spraying your property? No, there is no fight between us and you. The only people that have caused you to believe there's a big fight is that that industry group I told you about, whose board of directors includes Monsanto, Warehouse, Syngenta, a Swiss company that makes the atrazine in our triangulate bodies. They're Swiss. They're on the board of directors of Paulette's group. And the fact is, is that having researched this, all the laws that have anything to do with pesticides in the state of Oregon have really been written by these lobbyists. Do you know that in, in this county, do you know that that group made it illegal for any local government in the state of Oregon to create a pesticide buffer zone for their jurisdiction? 
Lane County cannot legally create one. You see? Why? Is there some natural law that makes it that we can't govern ourselves locally? No. It's that that group made that law. No one even knows they did it. So my peace offering is what I'd like to see for a, a quick compromise solution is, hey, since it ain't us local people flying these helicopters all over the tops of the mountains above our house, and it ain't you local farmers either, let's create an emergency aerial spray buffer zone around homes and schools and know that, yeah, we didn't solve the whole problem. There could be volatilization from ground space. All that needs to be studied. But right now, how many people think we have enough evidence to call the governor and say, we want an aerial spray buffer zone around homes and schools right now? Thank you, my friends. I've known this community since I was 10 years old. And I, my dad was in the lumber industry. I'm extremely proud of it and what he has done in that industry. I've talked today numerous times about this, the pesticides and Aaron, and I've learned a lot. I like to see how far we have come because I remember a time when those helicopters were coming down, watching two guys out in the lake get doused by stuff, and them saying, oh, well, I guess they got a good exposure of that. Those, pa those two gentlemen were the same age as my parents. Neither one of them are here anymore. I was exposed by helicopter spraying about 10 years ago, and numerous times when I was younger. The one of 10 years ago was the worst. We were taking care of a gentleman with cancer. And unfortunately, the berries that he, we were feeding him that morning had just been sprayed. We tried to wash everything off as quickly as we could. We were all outside when the helicopter came. It did not stop at the creek. It did not stop at the edge of the hill. And if any of us know anything about the winds here, they don't go straight. We can't predict them. I really appreciate everybody who has been here and keeps up this fight. Because the exposures I had when I was younger, I wonder how much is still affecting me. A lot of you know that my sister just recently went through cancer. My mom had a double mastectomy when I was in high school. And one of our, out of four children of mine was born with a cleft lip. So I wonder how much of that is from the exposure I had from running around all over these hills. These hills that now have cancerous deer. I've had three hunters close to me. Go get their dinner. We're going to put it in the freezer. But they couldn't eat it because it had so many tumors in it. Our deer are patchwork, so are raccoons, and our squirrels and our chipmunks. Sorry, they're not getting the notice about the spray. Hmm. But I want to keep seeing the passion that we have in our community towards this. I don't see a high there a little bit where we're just going this way. But I also see an awful lot of people that are trying to come together for this. And you. Thank you very much for the numerous times, the couple of times that you have come in, and the rest of you. Because we appreciate and we really need for somebody up there to be listening to us. Because like I said, I'm probably the next one out of my family. And I don't want it to be any of you. I'm just a uh, visitor and observer here. I'm from uh, Coos County, and uh, I'm facing some of the same things that you people are here. People are here and I was influenced. Uh, my life goes back quite a ways, but I don't want to talk about that. Uh, the, uh, 
I had a clear cut above me on Elmore between Douglas and uh, Coos County in the uh, temperate rainforest, uh, a high volume uh, area for logging, which is uh, being exported now and the price is going up and uh, it become a plantation system for the export market. But it's all money driven. But uh, I have a clear cut uh, done in my area in 2012 in uh, February and uh, and uh, they uh, I, they showed me everything how it was done. I got a real long with, with the timber companies and everything. And then in, uh, I become a subscriber. And then in, uh, in uh, October they uh, they wanted to uh, come up and stay with the helicopters. And they had the uh, atrazine and 2,4-D on their list, a whole bunch of them. And I was told by the state force, well, that's priority information. We're not going to give it out to you. So I went over to uh, Pam Blake, the DEQ over there in Coos County, and she said, I'll go bargain with them people. And I, I had the two state forces go over there, and I confronted the uh, timber company, with, actually, I don't want to give a name, it was Loma, and I confronted them, and, and uh, I along with them real well until I mentioned trying to late. And they kind of got their attention with the board over there. And uh, I, told that, I told that forester who was in charge of the tree planting in the spring, to remove, I don't care what he puts in, but don't use any anthracene. Because in the European Union, they banned it in 2003, 2006, and there's a lot of studies been done on that, and the stuff gets in the drinking water. And I had a well dug up there, and, uh, and it's the case, and if you don't have a hard rock going down, that stuff is going to creep in. And that anthracene, it creeps around, and there's studies on it, it creeps around for years, and that stuff, it's unpredictable, it's a wandering thing. And, uh, so, uh, and I had a, they come out again in uh, April this year, so I got a report and I went over and made a copy and I made sure that they gave me a copy from the forest and I have two foresters standing, one by my well and one my property line up there. So, so they, uh, they indicated, well, uh, this whole thing is, uh, we live in a chemical world and if we face it, we like it for better or not, we got to get along with people. And uh, so uh, I, I belong to also the Colt Hill watershed where we have a, a salmon habitat. I'm involved with that, a band of marsh, you know. It's an environmental issue down there. And the, uh, there's plenty of funding for that purpose. And uh, I, I meet with the timber representative, the biologists and that. So uh, I, I don't think that the science is the answer. These things in nature creep up and uh, science isn't a quick fix for everything. From what I observe over here, you people are going to be uh, washed over and science is going to quick fix, but it isn't. These things come up a long time and, and the health issues in this country, we're not the healthiest country in the world. Over in Europe, uh, we're way below, we're only about 33rd in, in, in the world. And the, these young people with the autism rate going up, it tells you that this chemical world, if it's pollution or this GMOs, all this business here, the people live on cheap food and all that, there's, there's problems out there and I commend you people for taking a stand and, and going on a local area to stand up to these people. And I was at the Environmental Law Conference in Eugene there at the University of Oregon and uh, they had Lindsay, I guess some of the people were there, who stood up and said, well, we got to take the, uh, the powers of be, which means the, uh, the state and federal, the kings and queens, and people left, left Europe to get away from this stuff. And now we're facing this area, uphill battle, and until we get the local people getting control, just like in, Jackson County down there, they're trying to get the, the, all of the GMOs banned from Jackson County and, and the state officials are trying to preempt it. So these are things, it's not only the herbicide, it's the whole industrial agriculture and everything, the life we live and the, the rich and powerful country we're in. And I thank you for your patience. again, which I've done now for the past two times that we've had town halls relative to this investigation. I come from Selma, Oregon in the Illinois Valley. When I heard there was an investigation, I was overwhelmed at the fact that possibly, finally, all the stories that I'd heard about when I first discovered in 2011 after retiring here in 1999 what all the helicopters were doing in my community, that something would be done about it. So I stand here again tonight as a wife, mother, grandmother, and a woman who after two long years still cannot fathom that I even have to present a case that I don't want to be poisoned or exposed to toxins. 
I stand before you seeking my right to health in a state that is yet to stop the probable trespass, knowing that many of those in this room tonight have already been exposed to toxic poisons, and yet those poisons continue to be sprayed. As for the public health assessment issued relative to an investigation that never was, this too is beyond the scope of my logic, in my view, for how does an investigation determine an assessment when there hasn't really been an investigation into chemical trespass before even conducting any drift studies or things that are relevant to trespass. There's two things, however, that we do know. We do know that we have yet to fathom the synergistic effects of multiple chemical cocktail combinations, let alone the risks of individual toxic chemicals, bearing in mind that we're not even allowed to know what 80% of each individual chemical is. We don't know what the excipients are made out of. We don't know what the additives are made out of because those things fall under the Freedom of Information Act that the chemical cartel has used as proprietary silence. And yet Oregon allows these cocktails to be sprayed repeatedly, in fact, in multiple toxic combination each and every spring and fall in communities all over the state. We do know that low dose science indications in this assessment are at best misguided. Our Stolen Future, written in 1996, speaks to low doses. There's also the extensive opinions offered by medical experts in the 2012 report from the Journal of San Francisco Medical Society with PhDs that indicate that, among other things, quote, many of these chemicals have effects at low doses, providing strong evidence that calculated safe doses of these chemicals are not, in fact, safe. There's far more data available, and yet that's what this investigation is supposed to be seeking. Information not coming from individual citizens my, like myself with zero medical or scientific backgrounds. Relative to Tyrone Hayes, that was my question. When I first found out that atrazine was being sprayed by helicopter by Lake Selmec, where I live, less than two miles, in fact 1.5 miles from where I live, one of the first things I did was find out about atrazine by researching, and he was the first name that popped up because he's a professor in Berkeley that was hired actually by Syngenta to investigate atrazine. But this scientist dared cross the line when he found out that atrazine is so toxic it needs to be banned off the planet. That's a direct quote from this professor who's been studying it for years and has multiple scientific peer review studies showing that atrazine is bad, bad, bad. It's an endocrine disruptor. It was banned in 2003 in Europe. Actually, it was outlawed. He loves to say that because it really ticks off the industry. They just won't renew the license because when it gets in the water, you can't get it out because it is toxic. Because in Switzerland, where Syngenta, its original manufacturer, came from, it's neither allowed there also. And how interesting that Syngenta is now in Salem advocating for the 633 bill so that we get to have Syngenta's GMOs crammed down our throat. Right. The low doses, to be clear, um, the key word is chronic, not just low dose. The, sim the systematic exposure of thousands of citizens of this state being exposed almost on schedule is the risk for over time, it's sadly time itself that's going to determine the risk. Will it be cancer, heart disease, or the slow accumulation of health issues that leads to goodness knows what? Health issues that in all probability are going to manifest in what was once an otherwise healthy individual. We just can't prove it. We now, however, know that those risks are in all likelihood great. Yet again, the potential scenarios taking place across the state and without any protection or precautions, or more importantly, zero warning. We literally have no time or inkling when to avoid, evade, or remove ourselves from the possible and probable trespass. Anyone living within range of these sprays, within the two or obvious two to five mile drift areas, assuming the weather's good and there isn't wind, which often is not the case, is likely going to be exposed. We then have the issue that these toxic cocktails change normally with each and every repeat application on average two to four per clear cut site. <laughs> Reality is we have no idea what all these poisons could or in all likelihood are doing to the health of the state. And certainly and more importantly relevant to this investigation, we have no idea what these toxins may be doing to our children, the body of the six year old or the endocrine systems of his parents all living within these pra practice areas and part of this investigation. The good thing is the human body is resilient for one example, simple reason. It wants to live. 
It happens to be the sole purpose of existence, in my view, to live. A wonderful quote sums it up. I'm not me living a life. I am life living a me. Life wants to live. Thus this investigation is behaving as if life is not their key motivating factor. Rather, it's the challenges, the funding issues, you name it, while the life that I so cherish, along with the lives of thousands of those across the state, are waiting, waiting, waiting. As if over 30 years has not been long enough. Oregon's history of using poisons is more than well documented. A Bitter Fog is a valid book to read. Our Stolen Future, I highly recommend. Raising Elijah by Sandra Steingraber, another excellent book. There's lots of research, there's lots of books, there's lots of studies by lots of doctors and lots of scientists. Oregon's history of using poisons is documented, as is it was in a bitter fog when we were dealing with things like Agent Orange. And the tactics, excuses, and the poisons keep on coming. Time is not on our side. This investigation and each member of this team has but one responsibility, to investigate why fellow citizens have been exposed and their bodies trespassed upon by what I venture to say 99% of us in this room tonight know is the timber industry. The very industry that Richard Whitman, our governor's natural resource advisor back in 2012, told Aaron King, Lynn Bowers, Amy Pincus, myself and our attorney that the governor's hands were tied. I fully comprehend each of you has a career to protect as far as the investigation team. I'm from the career world. I too had a career. I know how valuable a career is when you've vested time and years of service wanting to reach that place of retirement. If only I'd been told when I chose Oregon after spending five years searching the West Coast for where I wanted to spend my retirement, that I moved into a toxic state and that I had no rights to protect myself or my health. If only the real estate agent had told me about the Oregon's Right to Farm and Forest Act. But no, it's kept secret until it's too late because that act takes away all my rights. I have no right to even complain. I have no right to even know when the poisons are coming. I oh, have true. literally no rights and neither do you because this state is determined that all the rights go to either agriculture or in this case, the timber industry. The truth is the state's obsession with toxic chemicals reveals an insidious past from Agent Orange to the investigation itself and atrazine in 2,4-D and a host of toxins that are not fit for frogs or salmons, let alone humans. The investigations know full well that somehow folks are being exposed and poisoned. Yet for two years, not so much as any of them have been stopped. Dare no initiative of an emergency moratorium on the spray. Even as citizens have proved that there's a serious exposure problem and the history of this state is available to all who want to research it. Knowing that these toxins are sprayed into residential neighborhoods, across our rivers and streams, next to our schools and into the air we breathe. I stand here tonight asking this investigation team to do the right thing. To actually investigate these practices once and for all. Stop the pretense also that it's just Highway 36 that is being exposed in Oregon to these poisons because anywhere there's a clear cut, we're all being exposed to these poisons. And air has no boundaries. And if nothing else, we're breathing their synergetic effects. It's time for the investigation to help us, the people that are depending on you for our health. The only way to do that is to ignore the frankly disgraceful laws this state has chosen to put into place to protect only those that are spraying the poisons while literally stripping citizens, unsuspecting retirees, and everyday people who have no clue or no idea what's even taking place. Do the right thing. Investigate and stop the chemicals that have been poisoning the state. Since attending all your meetings, pleading with the state agencies after state agency for years, doing everything by the book, playing by all the rules, only to find the state is determined to continue to allow known hazardous practices we're now demanding that these toxins and these practices end. The Right to Farm and Forest Act be damned. We demand our right to health, and more importantly, our right to the peace, safety, and happiness afford us, afforded us, supposedly, in Oregon's Constitution. Mm -hmm. We're not going away. At this rate, we will be here well past midnight. I'm going to ask again, I know that you feel strongly and you've come prepared to say what you feel like you need to say. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pull out the shepherd's hook, but there are 27 
excuse me, 22 more people to speak. So I would really like to ask that the remainder of you do your level best to be brief and succinct. And sorry, Ray, but I'm pointing to you next, Ray Roller. One, one first thing I wanted to say is that on the post board up here, I know they said. It said up here that there are no standardized methods for all these herbicides. I think that's atrocious. I think that's just the sickest, stupidest thing ever. It shows, it shows the whole problem. There needs to be, they've been spraying this herbicide. I, let me start at the beginning of my uh, dissertation here. So, so let me get a couple minutes. I'm a, a son of a farmer. I'm a son of a farmer's son. And, and uh, it goes back in Norway to hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But in the 1940s, the late 1940s, uh, they started using herbicides on our farm. 2,4-D was the wonderful one that we first got. My mother lasted 13 years after that. She got colon and liver cancer. Then my father died of the same thing. My brother Jerry died of brain and liver cancer. Then my brother Don died of brain and liver cancer. Then my brother Lloyd died of stomach cancer. And Marvin, my another brother, got prostate cancer. He survived. The only one. Myself, I get colon polyps removed every three years. I'm still here begging for mercy. English common law concerned exclusively with property rights for the basis of our U.S. Constitution. Under this wonderful system, if you don't own property, you are property. If you own property, you can destroy it, use it any way you want, borrow on it to buy more, poison it, burn it, kill all the critters and weeds, the corporate fascists in charge of our economy and regulation, regulatory agencies, permit this, encourage and profit from this, type of exploitation and destruction. All this ignores a more important, more basic and fundamental sacred property right and duty. Our bodies are our temples, our holy space, and our right to protect our own being is the most important property right of them all. If you choose to defile your temple, corporate fascist laws allow that, but it is my property right to prevent you from harming myself and my children and my children's children and so on. These pesticides are all what we can call antibiotic, that is, against life. I demand accountability. If you can't or won't test for a particular poison, you may not use it. That's my demand. When used, when used perhaps by helicopter spraying, these poisons do not obey the applying agency and damage the chosen enemy only. In any war, including this misbegotten war on weeds beginning on my farm in the 1940s, most of the damage is collateral. You think when you spray that you are godlike, killing your righteous enemy for your own sacred profit and property right. In fact, you are poisoning the air, which does not belong to you. You are poisoning the earth, water, which the water which does not belong to you. You're poisoning the earth, our mother, which all sentient beings depend on for liberty and the pursuit of happiness and life. Your right to poison ends where my right to not be poisoned begins. Your poisons do not respect artificial property lines, so you need to stop poisoning your neighbors. All the scientists who know what they're talking about agree with me. Now is the time, right now, to cancel the apocalypse. Don't postpone it, delay it, rearrange, cancel the damn thing. <laughs> I'm going to start with a quote from Ruth Shear, molecular geneticist. Quote, the idea of a safe carcinogen is a fallacy. The idea of a safe carcinogen is a fallacy. I'm glad Elizabeth Allen touched on uh, clopyrrolid and the revolatilization of it because that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, I was part of the team that took the air sample that found that chemical in the air, clopyrrolid. Um, a little more information about that is that it was post-spray. It was 12 hours after the spray occurred, meaning this is revoltization off the ground. This is not that chemical right when it was sprayed. So the levels that you are seeing are actually levels that were revolatizing off the ground. If the air current would have been heading towards that machine that day, the levels would have been much higher. It wasn't until dusk 
when the air currents changed and the air starts flowing downhill towards the sampler, towards the people, that we actually caught it. So if you look through the paperwork a little bit more, you're going to understand that that was post 12 hours post application. And that sample sat in my freezer for a month. And I know that stuff degrades and breaks down. So if I would have sent that in right when I had that air sample, what level would we have found then? Okay? That's what we're dealing with. There's so many discrepancies here that you have to read between the lines. <clears throat> also, on November 22, 2011, we just uh, detected MCPA in the air of Horton Road residents. MCPA is a weed and feed used to both fertilize and kill weeds at the same time, usually pasture land. There are just too many uncertainties with the effects of these pesticides on our bodies. For instance, page 35 of the report states, quote, no short-term or acute inhalation toxicity values for clopyrrolid exist. Okay. They go on to say, many chemicals are more toxic via the inhalation pathway than the ingestion pathway. Mm -hmm. We're definitely inhaling it. We've been telling you this from square one. Mm -hmm. Page 23 of the report has more uncertainties. We do not know if participants were exposed to other pesticides at the time of sample collection since we are only able to check for 2,4-D and atrazine metabolites in urine. Next line, same page, quote, Currently, there is little scientific information about the health implications of exposures to multiple chemicals at low doses. Major uncertainty. Page 18, there are no NHANES values for comparison for children under six years old. My youngest child, Toby, sitting right over there, who tested positive three times in a row, was five at the time. And I've heard there was children even younger than that who also tested positive in the state urine samples for forestry pesticides. We cannot allow uncertainties of this magnitude to occur when the health of our entire community, especially our children, are at risk. This is not the first time Oregon citizens have had to deal with this topic. 1983, Oregon's Ninth Circuit Court heard and ruled on a case, Southern Oregon Citizens Against Toxic Sprays versus Clark, also known as the Katz case. That court ruled, quote, the BLM's belief that its herbicides are safe does not relieve it from the possibility that they are not. When their own experts admit that there is substantial uncertainty, when uncertain, uncertainty exists, it must be exposed. Mm -hmm. And ever since, the federal lands have not been sprayed with pesticides. Mm -hmm. So here's what I suggest. I think it's time for the big private timber companies, and that is anyone owning over 5,000 acres or more be subject to the same criteria that the federal lands are. That would eliminate the helicopter applications and still allow the mom and pop farms to operate as normal. It's not the small logging outfits using the helicopters, okay? Real estate investment trust Warehouser, they're not, they call themselves real estate investment trust Warehouser, alone owns one ninth of Lane County. One company, one ninth. There are about 3 million acres in Lane, and Weyerhaeuser owns 340,000 acres of it, just in our county. It's all about these big tim timber companies maximizing their profits. These same companies are also exempt from timber taxes, which the small timber owners have to pay. Do they deserve more money? Not at the expense of the community, they don't. I'm going to end with a quote from Jim Furnish, who managed the Siusalaw National Forest in the 90s, and who later became Deputy Chief of the Forest Service. 
So making the transition from pesticides onto the forest is economically possible, according to Jim. Quote, it was more costly, more labor intensive, but forestry in Oregon is profitable under many different scenarios. The Forest Service just saddled itself to a different horse and rode off into the future. Yeah. Hello, my name is Rowan Waking and I live on Fish Creek Road. I was 11 years old in 2011 when I tested positive twice for both atrazine and 2,4-D. I was 12 in 2012 when the state's testing showed 2,4-D in me for a third time. In 2011, my little brother and I had severe coughing and mild vomiting for seven months. No doctor could explain it. The helicopters have been gone for the last year and a half, and so is our cough. When you all go back to your work tomorrow, please remember the children trying to grow up with these potentially dangerous chemical exposures. Thanks. These questions are going to be helpful in the microphone. Raise the mic up so we can hear you, Dan. I'll just do what everyone else there you can. go. These questions are going to be helpful in allowing me and others to publicly comment on the report before the deadline. Um, I'll try to make it really brief. So, my name is Dan Snyder. I'm here tonight on behalf of Standing Together to Oppose Pesticides and other citizens that have been exposed to pesticides in this area from the laws of Charlie Tebbit. Um, first of all, I think uh, I want to say thank you to the investigation team for coming out here. I know it takes tremendous agency resources and personal efforts to come out, to triangle lake, do meetings like this till the wee hours of the night. So, thank you. Um, secondly, uh, I heard earlier a mention that you would be willing to accept scientific studies on atrazine. And it, it sounds to me like you'd be willing to consider those studies and looking at the next draft or getting ready to the final draft. And I just want to confirm that, for instance, if we submit some stuff from Tyrone Hayes, who has found that one part per million of atrazine will cause a frog to go from a female to a male, um, would you consider that in establishing or at least evaluating whether the amounts of atrazine that people are being exposed to can cause problems? I think that's, you're referring to the, to the response that Dr. Ferrer gave a little bit earlier. That's right. And I would concur, absolutely, that we will look at any credible Excellent. science. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my second point has to do, question and point, has to do with the statistical significance of the amount of people that had 2,4-D in their system. Um, in the report you said 22 out of the participants had levels of 2,4-D that were in the 75th percentile compared to in Haynes' study. And the statistical significance of that was 0 0.06. That's what you guys found out. Uh, so that's one one-hundredth of a difference from 0 0.05. Uh, as a researcher, when you come up with a result like that, does it make you want to go back and take a closer look? I mean, it seems like it's right on the cusp of being statistically significant. Do you guys have plans to come back and do more urine analysis based upon that 0 0.01 difference? Um, well, uh, the issue of, of additional urine sampling is, is less driven by trying to confirm a statistically significant difference between this a, a group here and NHANES. Um, it's very possible that at some point we would consider doing additional biomonitoring. The issue that we have is knowing where and when to test, and that is the problem that we ran up against in the spring 2012 mm -hmm. testing scenario. So the air testing that we are looking toward EPA to do, um, what we're hoping is that we'll begin to formulate a picture of how these, these chemicals might be moving in the, in the environment. And that would give us a better sense of where we could, if we were going to do additional biomonitoring, to be more focused, you know, both in both the time and space, for when we would do that. So. Do you have any of the 2013 spray application plans? And have you used those to evaluate where you're going to do any type of monitoring in the future? Are you talking about the air monitoring? Uh, air monitoring or your analysis, either one. 
It sounds like you might. We have, have not. We have not developed an, uh, a, a sampling plan for the air monitoring at this point. And am I correct when I read that section of the study that the one child that was excluded would have tested above the 75th percentile? The study. The study says we excluded. About the the we fall excluded 20, 2011. Yes, and it says we excluded one child because there is no comparative value. Uh, I mean, right. just assuming that maybe that kid was, I don't know, what, 10? Uh, would that have made the statistical significance, 0.05? That's a, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, we're probably going to take a look and see if we yeah, added that child back in. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. And I think the, important, the importance here is not whether it, it was or it wasn't. It, you know, we didn't dismiss it because it was at 0.06 rather than 0.05. We, we looked at that and said it was nearing statistical significance and um, it kind of took that into account. And we're not, we weren't dismissing it because it wasn't, was at 0.06. I, I think it's really important to, to clarify that we can't do something like that. We can't just say, well, we'd like this, this bit of data to be something else and do the comparison. We cannot make up things. If we don't have an appropriate value, we just need to admit that. And, and exclude that point. I mean, the solution is more data. So, right, so not to, to fudge that, the that I agree with. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. More data. I, I think actually, and are, are you hearing your, your last question? I, I think that's actually one of the points that I, I, I tried to say earlier on, and maybe I didn't say this explicitly. We, we are trying to draw, answer those six questions that we talked about earlier with exceedingly little amount of data. Mm -hmm. Right? We know we need more data, mm -hmm. but we have to be purposeful and, and specific about what, where we're going for it next so that we're efficient with where we go. And that's why the air monitoring is so important. So is it fair to say it would be very premature to stop the study now? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, finally, the one last piece here. Um, so w with regard to the nine post-spray samples, I think you guys made four conclusions on what I feel is probably the most important paragraph of the whole study. It's on page 28 or 29, I believe. And it says uh, four conclusions. One, um, we know that atrazine travels up to four miles. We know, two, that there were only four atrazine applications within that area, within the 24-hour period when it happens. We know that all the people that came back had statistically higher levels of atrazine in the body. And I guess I combined two of them there. But my point is, all, all, the, all the direction says that, boy, there's no other explanation for how the atrazine came into these people's bodies. I mean, you know, it quacks, it waddles, it has feathers. I mean, it seems to me that you guys could have gone that next step and said, it's not just possible that these exposures were coming from these four applications, but in fact, very likely just because you guys did a really good job of eliminating all the other sources. Mm -hmm. um, so I would ask that you guys perhaps revisit that conclusion and say, you know, at least for these nine people, the evidence strongly suggests mm -hmm. that these exposures were caused by one or more of the four atrazine applications. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the first thing is I want to thank um, the question that was even posed to start this study. I want to thank you for your investigation and um, your conclusions and what you found. I'm not speaking only for myself. I'm speaking for over 70 other people in the community that have signed um, this statement that um, I'm going to make to you. Um, the park announced to the Lake Creek community on July 14, 2011, that a pesticide exposure investigation would be conducted in our community. Oregon Health Authority was the lead agency on this investigation. A cross section of 64, 66, I guess if you include the children, um, volunteers was selected. The study was conducted by expert agencies with standard protocols for data integrity. Upon completion of the study, the community was notified of the results. This was done in a document uh, released to the public March 5, 2012. Quote, none of the urine samples contained a detectable concentration of atrazine or its metabolites. The, particip the participants 
were not exposed to 2,4-D at levels that are expected to cause adverse health effects. We, us 70, do not feel that there is evidence of a concerned health risk here. The second thing, after the original study was completed, OHA then allowed self-collected data from a local group to be incorporated into the study. Again, the results as published in the May 9, 2013 report under, quote, what health risks are associated with these exposures, page 53, conclusion number 14 through 18 all indicate not expected to harm people's health. Again, over 70 of us conclude that we are not concerned with our health. Most folks have lived in this community for over 35 years. We've been exposed to spraying, to clear cuts, and we're still here, we're still healthy. Um, and so what we say to you is, now that the investigation has been completed, the residents of Lake Creek Community request that Park and OHA respect the community and discontinue any further investigation of this <laughs> 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 but I do live in the Saisla watershed at the bottom of a big hill, which was clear cut in the 90s. And I'm up here to ask people to think outside the box about solutions. In life, there are so many solutions to any given problem. And if we stand on a circle outside and look for solutions, I think we can find them and we're locked into this thing with the herbicides. So after the hill behind my house was clear cut. It was eerie for weeks. It was silent. There was no bird song. And this is something maybe people don't look at, but where were the birds? They were gone. And one by one they started to come back. So that was one piece. Cancer takes a long time to develop. It has an initiator and a promoter and it takes about 20 years to develop. So maybe that's not a thing you're going to notice. But I noticed the absence of birds for weeks. When international papers sold out to Roseburg Timber, Roseburg suspended the mechanical trimming of the roadsides and they went to spraying. Well, within a few months, the blackberries were back. The spraying didn't work. The blackberries were growing back over the road. So they had to revert back to the mechanical way of doing it. So asking people to think outside the box, maybe we don't need helicopters, we need jobs. People could be out there doing, mm -hmm. and, uh, promoting the economy on an individual level. Um, I forgot my third part. I think I'll just close and say thank you for being here, everybody. And hopefully you can find others. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Joseph Power. I've been a veterinarian since 1991. And um, I was with Gail Henry up there when they were spraying above us, um, sitting with Don Parmenter, who was dying of cancer. Uh, we could look him in the eye. That man could see every single one of us, and we could see that cloud floating over us. And um, we were sick from nausea and headaches for, for quite a while. There must have been about a dozen of us, including children. And I, I almost forgot to add that until Gail got up there. Got up there, thank you. Um, I grow trees, but um, stuff I've learned in school and, and all this that's going on, I won't spray any poisons. Mm -hmm. and, and I ranch organically, but my, my cows drink out of the creek, and, and I believe that they are getting chemically dirty. And my cows are getting into your food supply, and, and I try the best I can not to get anything in there, but it's not up to me, it's up to these people with money who are doing this brand. Mm -hmm. Um, I would just like to add, I surely miss all my friends that have died from cancer. It just seems like there's way too many young people that have died. And, and they'd be here if, if they could, but their word won't be heard by anybody because cancer does take a while to come on. It doesn't come right away. And um, 
I, I would like you to join with me to pray for all those people. Pray to God for those people who spray poisons because you're killing people. You yes, really are. Yes, you are. Uh, my name's Jason Clem, and uh, I'm a local farmer, and we, I do use herbicides, and I would just like to respond to Dave Owens assertion that the atrazine is coming from local farmers with the 13 samples that had atrazine. Uh, local farmers do not use atrazine in the winter for the same reason that foresters do not because it's a grass killer and the grass isn't growing over the winter so you to spray it would not do any good it wouldn't work on the grass. Um, so to say that the atrazine in those 13 samples is accounted for from local farmers, I believe, is misleading and untrue. Um, and I think there's a lot of misleading information going around. But it, I would also like to say if you can't locate the source of the atrazine, in those 13 samples, um, doesn't that raise questions about the validity of all the community-based data? That's the rest of Jay and Park, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. scientifically of the uh, atmospheric testing that is projected to be done, but you know, we're all biomonitors out there and when we smell the spray and get startled by it, we know we're being exposed by it. We know it's coming through the air and we know it's getting into our bodies, it's getting into our lungs. And we may not know what it's doing there, but we know we're getting exposed. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mel Gertov. I'm a semi-retired political science professor who now is trying to be a farmer. My wife in uh, Deadwood. And, um, as a political scientist, uh, in a way, we face some of the same kinds of analytical questions that you folks confront. Um, and have to rely not just on evidence, but on intuition and logic in coming to conclusions. Um, you folks asked a fundamental question, which you have answered very clearly, I think whether or not people have been exposed to hazardous substances. I think you answered yes. yes. But you had a much, as I read the report, which I only got to tonight, um, you had a much harder time dealing with the data issue, the evidence issue. Because some data is lacking, some of it is ambiguous, uh, some of it is not comparable, and so forth. And thus you came up with the same kind of arduous wording uh, in your conclusions that we in political science, unfortunately, also come to when we deal, in my case, with international affairs. And so you had phrases uh, which some people have, have, uh, have cited about something being slightly greater than expected or unknown how these levels compare or without a reference population it's not possible to or available evidence suggests it is possible that and so on. I'm very familiar with that language. <laughs> um, national leaders all over the world use that sort of stuff all the time. But on one hand, one could, I think, I have, I have to say in all fairness that uh, anyone reading this report with all the qualifications could come to a wildly different conclusion about what to do, if anything, about the problem. There's something in here for everybody, unfortunately, uh, because of all the loopholes. 
none of which are of your making, but which uh, nevertheless force you to just say at the end, for the most part, that, well, we have to keep on keeping on with mining the data and trying to get more of it. But my point is a little bit different, and here's where I'm disappointed with this report, in, when, when you come to the end. Uh, it seems to me that when you have answered the question in the affirmative that we're dealing here with dangerous substances, that the logical conclusion should be, given the impact that it has, which you've now heard about, uh, for all these folks, that one must step back and adopt the precautionary principle. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, don't, I don't see how, as responsible scientists, you can avoid coming to that conclusion that yes. we have to stop at the water's stop. edge here. Mm -hmm. Stop. Because the precautionary principle, as you well know, and has been applied internationally mm -hmm. in, many, in many instances, uh, including with respect to 2,4-DT and, and, and other dangerous substances, which you have documented are, in fact, in play here, uh, tells you that until you know something more, the dangers to public health outweigh any other interests. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. And thus, uh, the notion that uh, that you you pointed to, which I appreciate, uh, that mediation would be a, a very good thing at this point, um, is is one possibility. Uh, the notion of a moratorium, which Amen. was mentioned by our very first yes. speaker, I think is an excellent idea. Yes. Yes. I really encourage you in your final report to, to take this into account. Uh, the lives of, of the individuals, uh, our fellow Oregonians, are at stake here. Enough so that we have to put those lives ahead of any other consideration. Thank you very That's much. That's right. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to second the eloquent words of my neighbor, Mel Zertoff. Yeah. I wish I'd said it myself. Um, I'd like to make two brief comments. I have not read the report. I plan to. Uh, but I did try to follow your explanation. And one thing I believe you said is you were not going to look at the health risk until you've shown that there's a significant risk. On that timeline of, of what's going to be happening, maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, not, it, not, quite. It, not quite. Not quite. Anyway, I would strongly encourage you to begin to look at the health risk. If nothing else, reviewing the data that's out there from other countries, other studies, before which we feel, at least a number of us feel, eventually we will find there is a significant level of these chemicals being taken into our bodies. Yep. One concern with that study is uh, for your median group, which is a average adult, I assume, I have three grandchildren. The youngest one is four years old, maybe 35 pounds. And so I'm a little concerned for her and other four-year-olds if they had possibly have reached that significant level. And if so, Please begin to look at those health risks, long-term risks. The other comment, I guess, is aimed at people from forestry that are taking the applications on the aerial spring. First of all, I'd like to see that banned. Yeah. But until that happens, I would like to see the rules followed and enforced. Where we live, the hills are very steep. You have to fly not way up high, you're supposed to stay down low. The helicopter would have to to stay within that height. They don't do that. They're not supposed to fly when it's too windy. Uh, my daughter-in-law had a serious health emergency. We met the ETM, uh, EMT. They said, we've got to get the right by helicopter. Unfortunately, the ridge was fogged in. She couldn't, they couldn't get over the ridge. So they had to continue. Unfortunately, she was safe, had to drive into Eugene. You cannot fly the helicopter when the fogged in. Well, when is it not fogged in? I go outside every day, I look at the weather two or three times. 
when it, no fog, it's sunny, and the wind is blowing. <laughs> Frequently, by late in the afternoon, blowing quite hard. I learned in a firefighter training this morning that uh, there are lots of things, including fog, that can deflect the wind. This area is not suited for aerial spraying. Right. Maybe there are some places in the state it's okay, but it's not here in Lake Creek watershed. Actually live just outside of the photo that was shown earlier this, on this talking period of the vineyard that was contaminated. And um, so what the study that you're doing here is very important for us. I mean, it's relevant for the entire state. We live uh, surrounded by Seneca, Roseburg Forest Products, and Weyerhaeuser, and all those forests are 50 years old, and we know we're going to be barraged with multiple companies spraying multiple times right around us. Um, Seneca was the first to clear cut, uh, and they uh, clear cut in uh, 2011 and they started spraying. Um, and uh, they sprayed for two years, uh, three or four rounds of spraying, and my neighbor who has a 40 acre piece that's a uh, catty corner to the spray, much closer than the vineyard was that got contaminated, uh, she got diagnosed with a rare, fast-growing cancer and um, uh, less than a year ago, and right now she's in hospice and she only has days to live. Now, obviously we can't draw a correlation between her cancer and that spring, but that's the trouble. We can't draw a correlation. When we don't have the data, we don't know. Uh, it's, it's good that you're doing this, but we we're worried, you know, because Roseburg Forest Products is going to start spraying, Warehouse is going to start spraying, uh, and we're going to get it from all sides, not just, you know, the one company in Seneca, and they spray multiple times, multiple years. So, and, and we know from your data that you've gotten so far that we will be contaminated, or that we have been contaminated, that we are walking with these herbicides in our bodies. Um, so, um, for one thing, you should broaden your study to include other communities in Oregon that are actively being sprayed yes. with yes. multiple chemicals. Yes. Um, or um, perhaps we shouldn't spend the taxpayer money at all for all the studies. I mean, this is a lot of money. What has this sequester hat got you? No studies then? Well, we should just ban aerial spraying altogether. Yes. You know, yes. Or, how about using the studies from Europe? Um, that was going to be one of my questions I, I had I didn't answer. I mean, this is, atrazine is what they spray above us. It's what they just got them spraying two weeks ago above us. And um, right above us. I mean, the helicopters have to fly right over our houses to turn around. I mean, that's how close we are to them. And it, we were sitting there looking at this knowing this chemical is banned in Europe. And, and your study come out, we know we're getting it in our bodies. Why can't you use the data that they used in Europe to look at? Why did they ban it there and not here? Do you know? I, I don't. Wait, if you could like read up on that, that would be great. <laughs> um, the other thing is, um, you know, you don't know what's a significant amount, what's going to harm us, but of course that's always variable according to the body that it's in. Very small children need a lot less. And I see the spray, because we're in a rural residential area, so we're in little 40 acre lots, and so there's a lot of school children with school buses. And I see uh, Seneca spraying this atrazine right when the children are waiting for the school bus, right underneath the clear cut. You know, and you saw, the picture it was called the Callahan Ridge, those cliffs and that are all being clear cut, and we all live on the flat place right under it. So it's contaminating quite a few people. And it would be a great area for you to come down and put up your air sampling devices. So I really I invite you to do that. And, um, you know, and I just want to emphasize the fact that BLM does not aerial spray, and they do fine, uh, when and if they do regeneration harvest. They, uh, they are able to successfully reforest. So it's, banning the spray altogether should definitely be the consideration. I mean, I understand we have to study this to death, and the studies take years and years and years. 
we should, maybe we should just ban, ban it all together. It, they'll do fine uh, with successful reforestation even if it is banned, so. Yeah. 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 Um, my name is Bobby Lindbergh. I don't live in this watershed, but I have a lot of friends in this watershed. And um, I'm a former water quality specialist. I retired from the Department of Environmental Quality in late 2011. And before that, I met a number of people from this watershed who expressed to me their concerns about pesticides um, in this watershed from forestry area sprays in particular. And um, as a water quality specialist, I went to my manager and told him that I was interested in taking, taking a closer look and seeing what was in the water. Um, and with my manager's permission, I developed a study to look at the waters um, in the Lake Creek watershed. Um, but lo and behold, um, the timber industry came and talked to my new manager and my study got canceled. Wow. Um, and along about that time, some of the folks in this watershed said, would you help us do this study on our own? We'll pay for it if you'll help us. And I'm a curious person. I wanted to find out, is there, was there pesticide in the water or not? Um, and so um, I agreed to help with the study. Um, and as it turns out, we missed almost all of the sprays, almost all of the aerial sprays in the spring. We only, we got our samplers in the water after most of those sprays had already happened. Um, but there were a couple. And we did find atrazine and hexazinum and, and metabolites of atrazine um, in our samplers. The highest amounts were at the mouth of Fish Creek. Um, it was on the property where several people who talked to you tonight have had um, 2,4-D and atrazine discovered in their urine. Um, and I'm not certain if the investigation team has looked at our samples closely, but in addition to the sampler at the mouth of Fish Creek, we had a sampler in Lake Creek, above where Fish Creek comes in. That sampler, um, <clears throat> okay, the sampler in Fish Creek could very well have been affected by runoff from sprays that were occurring in the Fish Creek watershed. However, the sampler in the Lake Creek, um, the sampler in Lake Creek could not have been affected by runoff because it, none of the sprays drained directly to Lake Creek. Therefore, that atrazine and hexazinone came from the air. Mm -hmm. yep. And I'd like to ask the investigative team Basically, you've said there's four possible ways of exposure, A, B, C, and D. You've said it isn't A, it isn't B, it isn't C. Why can't you say it's D? Yeah. Well, I thank you all for sticking around tonight. And um, I just want to let you know how much I really love my community. And um, there's a bunch of really wonderful people here in this community. And I feel like a very important part of this community and feel very connected to y'all. And um, I want to also thank the investigative team for the work that they've done. And would like you to investigate this truth. I know for a fact that these chemicals are dangerous. I have been real poisoned many times. My first poisoning that I um, took was on Friday, October 12th, 2007. I took a four hour exposure that day and it took literally months, and I'm talking about nine months, for me to start feeling better. And right about the time I started feeling better, they started spraying again in the spring. Now, I can assure you that these chemicals are dangerous and are something that takes a long time for it to get out of your body. That first exposure on October 12th that I took, a four-hour exposure that Roseburg Timber Group was doing one half a mile from our property, I have a friend who was with me during that time. He's my neighbor. 
he died three weeks ago of Parkinson's disease. And he wasn't that old. And he was a vital man. And we're talking just a few years ago. What, what is that, about six years ago? And he's gone. And he was with me that day that I first took that exposure. Um, many other times I've taken these exposures. Uh, the aerial sprays from Weyerhaeuser have terribly sickened me and my animals, my children. Also, the ground sprays that Seneca Jones does around the lake, also I have been sickened by. So please just investigate that truth coming from a, a real person who has really experienced getting sick. This is real. I'm really concerned about um, the colony collapse that is occurring and um, I believe that it is um, due to pesticides um, and that um, it just really needs to stop. That bees go out and they are bioindicators because they pick up the, um, they land on the plants and all the flowers and everything and, and pick up the toxins or whatever is there, you know? They want to be picking up pollen. They don't want to be picking up pesticides. It makes them go crazy and they can't find their home and then they, um, they're not able to regenerate and give us honey. And then they bring back the honey or the pollen to create honey, and then that honey will be um, contaminated. So we don't want to have contaminated honey. We don't want to have. We don't want to eat contaminated food from pesticides. So please, just stop this thing. Thank you. So much better with so many less people. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I wish everybody was here, but at the same time, it's a little less intimidating than this. Um, a quick question, can anybody raise your hand if you have the ability to ban pesticides? Can anybody raise your hand that has the ability to ban helicopter spraying? These people cannot really help you. They can provide data. Their own process has rendered them irrelevant. They've made that clear, in my opinion. Um, Another quick question. Is it fair to call these things poisons? They're poisons, right? I don't think that's extreme or radical to call them poisons. If I came onto your property and sprayed you with poison, how would you feel if you didn't have the right to defend yourself? We do not have the right to defend ourselves. That is a right that has to be taken. Just like every significant right that the American people have, they were all taken. When the people in control are benefiting from their decisions that are harming the people, they're not going to give that up. They're benefiting from that. The people in control, the people making these rules, it is perfectly clear they come to these meetings, they run our governments, and they benefit from allowing companies to poison us. I want to encourage everybody here to go to stop-oregon.org and join us on Tuesday, June 11th, at the Triangle Lake Boat Dock to get involved in the campaign to stop these pesticides from spraying, whether the government will or not. If you want these pesticides to stop falling on your homes and poisoning your families and killing our people, we have to stop those pesticides. It is unacceptable to me that somebody can spray a chemical on me in my own home and there is nothing I can do to stop it. I insist that there is something I can do to stop it. I can stop that helicopter from spraying, and so can you. Join us movement. It's growing across the state. When you want rights, you have to take them. This is a natural right to a clean, happy life. If people want to choose to use poisons on their land, it is their responsibility to keep those poisons on their land. If they cannot keep those poisons on their land, I believe that we have the right to stop them from using those poisons. Those poisons come on trucks. Those poisons come from factories. Those poisons are brought into our community on an infrastructure that can be used against them. And direct action gets the goods.
how to grill all by themselves. In the microphone? They've been doing it for centuries, eons. Just hold it closer to your lips. Oh, yeah? There you oh, yeah. Go. <laughs> okay. The trees know how to grow. Yeah. Now, what is all this about? It's about money. It's about people More making money. money. That's what it's about. That's, it's as simple as that. There was a kid at the, I went to the March Against Monsanto in Eugene on Saturday. And there was a kid, he had a sign, and I think it said everything. It said, I am not a science experiment. And don't fight each other. Fight, fight the people who are responsible. You know, for you guys. I mean, I'm not really in this community. I'm in the neighborhood, but not in the community. And, and I just don't fight each other. This is, they're not the, other people aren't the problem. The problem are the laws, and the problem is the greed, and the problem is all that. You know, how we fight it, I don't know, but don't fight each other. Thanks. Uh, my comments are more for the uh, agency folks that are here, and I want to thank you for the work you've done, for the investigation, and for caring about the community here. I think uh, a lot of appreciation goes to your efforts. And um, I think that this investigation you're doing is a case study. I'm part of the Oregon Pesticide Action Work Group, which is a group that meets monthly um, for rural residents throughout Oregon who are concerned about pesticides. This group has been meeting for over three and a half years on a monthly basis. And on average, we have phone calls from Tillamook, Marion, Lane, Lincoln, Benton, Lynn, Douglas, Curry, Josephine, Jackson County. All of the residents in those counties are calling in on a regular basis with these same concerns. They are being exposed to pesticides. And so while the work you're doing here is good and admirable, it is merely a case study. And I think that the dangers to public health are clear. I, I don't think people are making this up. Or they wouldn't be taking the time to share with one another on how to improve the situation. And I know there's not enough money and there's not enough staff to go around to do studies in every single one of those counties. So I do think that um, we have to recognize that the study that you're doing can possibly be more than, as you've said yourself, a snapshot in time that you're unable to take into account critical windows of development for children, special medical situations for uh, other vulnerable people, where a reference dose, as uh, Dr. Ferrer explained, it, it's just not uh, relevant for those populations. We can't protect them, which leads us back to the precautionary principle. That's what we should be working with, the precautionary principle, because <coughs> your study is only that, a case study and a snapshot in time. And for that, we need to look toward protecting public health and if that takes a moratorium, then that is what our state needs to do. It's probably not so many people here that my voice can't carry. So it's been a long night. I want to thank you for your, your patience and your attention. And uh, we'll stick around here. We're going to be putting chairs away. So if you want to come up and ask a question, feel free. Grab a card. Um, and we will be in touch. Thank you. I want to go to the